Antes de um hum niga, Radzald an malak es fredzas, Durant in todo e me mu. A no gui distancia, Como cupo gui palo. Zaniman malak kofi i konuna sugi ayri preba tula nuti na ipandera ta gaigi pues. Atten fanny bandera Co is the pogwa puma la la pa Gilo tonu man libri Sentomiti man co
na 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 hey yeah 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 ooh na 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 hey yeah 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 ooh na 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 hey surprise you with your favorite things dance with me by the ocean under the moonlight cause I'm loving how it shines on you as the sweet sweet scent of your perfume just takes me away to a land of peace near the sea of love near the gardens of nature in the heavens above and I know it's real more than a dream when you're alone with me and just falling in love right here I hope you're loving the view. Let this tropical breeze set you in the mood. Just falling in love right here in paradise. Ooh, I hope you're loving the view. Let this tropical breeze set you in the mood. Oh, ooh, na 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 na. Hey, yeah 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Ooh, na 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 na. Hey. I bet you're tasting like coconut candy. Oh, honey, may I take a bite in this love story? Let your uncle do the gun no shake with no no worry. And tomorrow we've been doing it all over again. I bet you're tasting like coconut candy. Oh, honey, may I take a bite in this love story? Let your uncle do the gun mo shake with no, no worry. And tomorrow we be doing it all over again. Just falling in love right here in paradise. Ooh, I hope you're loving the view. Let this tropical breeze set you in the mood. Just falling in love. I hope you're loving the view. Let this tropical breeze set you in the mood. Sing. Ooh, All right, na, let's na, go. Na, 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 na. Hey, yeah, no. yeah, Good morning, Guam. Viva Bene. Bene. Friday. Made it to Friday. Yeah, we did. Running into this Friday. Good morning. Good day. Good morning. Morning, morning, morning. It's Friday, the 7th day of August. And it's the link on the breeze, 93.9. Good morning, Sabrina. Good morning. How was your day, you know, yesterday and tonight? Yeah. <laughs> yesterday was an exciting day after our show. Yeah. Uh, we did a little thing <laughs> with our friend Melker. Yeah, we did. Which we're going to air on Monday. Monday. Mm. Uh, don't, we're not going to give away too much, even though Melker already posted on his Facebook about it. He did? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see it. Um, yeah, but Bree, thank yeah. you this morning for bringing a little sunshine in at uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Can we, please? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I gave up trying to bake against Sabrina, and you can you guys are going to see why in a second, but... You know, I'm really not... Um, don't do okay, don't right. start on the negative. Let's start on the positive. Oh okay. yeah. Look at that, guys. Wait, I, okay. And can just let you gotta I'm, go lo- I'm lucky I didn't get slapped this morning because yeah. I was like, oh look at those breeze salmon. Yeah, it's not Who makes Yeah, salmon Jason. Cupcakes? Salmon cupcakes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even respond. I was like, fool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what do we have she here? Did not say fool. <laughs> what what do we have here, Sabrina? Oh, it's a uh, guava. Strawberry guava. All right. Something like that. Something like that. Oh, it's a little something like strawberry guava, nothing fancy. <laughs> Just yeah, two uh-huh. bougie fruits in one uh-huh. cupcake. But is that cream cheese? Is that yeah, a cream, it's cheese, cream frosting? cheese frosting? Oh. Right, yeah. With the guava gel on top. So Jason was thinking it was salmon and cream cheese, right? Yeah. That makes sense. It's not, though. So that's our uh, breakfast uh, this morning. Of course, I bought empanada at the store, but I ain't going to put that next to that. <laughs> Uh, it's the link on the breeze, 939-615. It's all proudly brought to you by Polka. Proudly distributed on Guam by Ambrose Inca. They've got the peach tea. They've got a cappuccino, of course. They've got everybody's favorite lemon iced tea. 
It's a polka also brought to you by IT and E and Calvo Enterprises. On this Friday, 615, as always, a great big huge show for you guys. There's a lot going on with COVID-19. Mm. And um, as always, when there's a lot going on with COVID-19, we try and get public health. Man, we, we got the director on the phone yesterday, and I, they're just so uh, busy, obviously, uh, responding to COVID-19 and also doing everything else that they do as a public health and a social services um, agency. Uh, so we, had, we spoke with a director and said, hey, in times like this, I feel like people want to hear they need to hear from at least Masaya Public Health. You know what I mean? And we, we talked about this yesterday about the absence of information and presence, but uh, we got a presence this morning. We'll talk to the uh, DPHSS contact tracing uh, team to find out about this day uh, yesterday where it was just nonstop, Sabrina. Yeah. Nonstop with just businesses uh, coming out and, and saying, hey, we had somebody who works here who tested positive. Oh, I was just no, no, you're right. Yeah. There were, and you know, I'm, I'm actually very appreciative that they, they, they came out and, and just let the public know, because a lot of the times you won't hear that from uh, the government agencies or public health. They don't necessarily announce where a positive uh, case um, may have occurred. So, right. kudos to these businesses for coming forward and just letting people know and letting their customers know that hey, this is what happened, and we're doing everything. Uh, and we have done everything uh, possible to sanitize, to disinfect, to keep our customers safe. We've followed all the guidelines. And, you know, unfortunately, this happened. We're praying for the families and those that are affected. So um, kudos to all the businesses and all the schools that have come forward. Right. And uh, hopefully we'll find out more about this, uh, all this rash of uh, positives. And, man, it's just uh, obviously it's. With the opening of the island, um, like they've always said, we're gonna we're gonna see some uh, positives. But I, I I'm just uh, concerned because, um, especially in like a restaurant setting, you know, the restaurant mm-hmm. setting is the one environment where we go in and we expose ourselves by taking off our masks to eat with whoever we're eating with and um, interacting with, you know, servers and all that stuff. So I, I think everyone I was talking to yesterday. Um, well, let's just put it this way: I think a lot of people are gonna be staying home for the next few days. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I don't really go out to eat at restaurants, but I do do takeout a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it's a takeout island now. Uh, 618. Uh-huh. So let's, let's just jump right into the uh, show here. Obviously, at uh, 9 o'clock, we're going to do the after party. That's going to be a lot of fun as uh, we have uh, lined up some uh, Robert uh, Underwood uh, supporters and some Michelson Nicholas supporters. And uh, it's been the hot topic uh, through the week, also the COVID uh, cases. Um, this like back and forth between... Uh, uh, the challengers in the Democratic Congressional primary. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun at uh, 9 o'clock. It's uh, KUAM News' Decision 2020. We call it the after party. Also, uh, 8.30, we're getting Senator Joe St. Augustine. Uh, maybe it was that call-out we did yesterday. We got I uh, got a text from his uh, chief. It was like, oh, yeah, hey, we want to come on now. <laughs> so he's coming on at 8.30 with the uh, Office of Finance and Budget Director, uh, Steve Guerrero. We're also going to go back into quarantine. Yes. The never-ending story. (laughs) The quarantine chaos. We have another quarantine story for you guys, and it is probably going to piss you off. So we'll uh, we'll do that uh, later on in the show, 619. Uh, Let's do a news update here. Uh, Our link update from the KUAM news team. Uh, Good morning to Tomas Manglonia. Hafni, good morning everyone. I'm Tomas Manglonia with your headlines on here on The Link. The island's total number of COVID-19 positive cases since mid-March is now at 397. According to the latest report out of the Joint Information Center, there are eight new cases of COVID-19 out of the 442 test samples. Of the new cases, six cases were from Public Health Lab and two from DLS. These cases are under investigation. Of the new cases, one case had recent travel to the continental U.S., two cases were identified through contact tracing, and three cases were identified through community screening. To date, there have been five deaths, 321 released from isolation, three hospitalized, and 71 active cases. Let the government budget debate begin. Lawmakers will meet in session next week to pass a spending plan for fiscal year 2021. On Wednesday, Finance Chairman Senator Joe St. Augustine finally released a revenue projection that he says the administration agrees with, but at least one senator believes they'll need a lot more information.
983 million dollars is what Senator San Augustine and the legislature's Office of Finance and Budget say is the amount of revenue the government will collect for FY21, just 8% less than the pre-pandemic projection for the current fiscal year. But speaking on KUAM's The Link Multimedia Show, Senator Therese Terlahi, who's been pressing San Augustine to release the numbers, says only that it's a good start. I want to commend OFB that they've actually uh, got the administration to to get off that, you know, there will be no adjustments to the budget at all, right. down to right. a, a very significant change to... Now we are looking at a reduced revenue amount and we are going to work hard to make that work. I want to make sure we are going to take care of critical services and we know what we have to do to take care of those critical services. But Terlahi says the administration needs to be more transparent about its spending. She'd like to know more about Federal CARES Act expenditures and previous appropriations that were never spent, like $10 million for hospital improvements. The numbers are in, but the reports are not. They're not due till August 20. By that time, we're, you know, um, almost at the end of our budget, right. you know, uh, deadline. And so that's why I'm asking for that information up front. How do you expect us to do a budget with this kind of information? And we should know what type of deficit did they actually pay down, like they said they would with the 2019 excess revenues. Are there any other excess revenues that they haven't spent? Because that would be very significant for us right now, don't you think? Session is scheduled for 10 a.m. Monday. The legislature is required by law to pass a budget by the end of this month. 23 years ago on this day, the tragic Korean Air Flight 801 crash occurred in Nimitz Hill. 229 lives, 229 lives were lost, and today those souls are remembered. A memorial ceremony was held at the monument located in the remote area. Family, friends, loved ones, and Guam lawmakers joined the Korean Association to commemorate the 23rd anniversary. Ina Lee with the Korean community shared her story. As Lee was working for the airline at the time and had lost her brother, who was on board that flight on August 6, 1997. It was really hard for me to live a life that uh, brother left while I'm working with Korean Air. But uh, God is giving us that he's in heaven with no pain mm -hmm. and resting in peace. So we got faith that we can live without it. But uh, every moment, every year anniversary is painfulness to uh, feel his soul. And he was my closest brother. Yeah. Lee says 185 bodies were never recovered, including her brothers. The monument is located on a military restricted area, which only allows visitors to come pay their respects on this one day a year. Lee says the pandemic was not going to stop her from visiting her brother. That's the news for now. We'll see you all tonight at 6, at six on Primetime. In more local news, a federal indictment was unsealed charging Vana Kamari Damai with conspiracy to distribute meth, possession of intent to distribute, and notice of forfeiture. According to court documents, on January 1st, 2019 through July 5th of this year, Damai allegedly conspired to distribute 50 or more grams of meth and approximately $32,000 was seized. Damai is scheduled to be arraigned this morning before Magistrate Judge Michael Berdalio. Naval Criminal Investigative Services, or NCIS, along with Criminal Investigation Division are investigating an incident that occurred on Naval Base Guam. According to a media release at around 11 o'clock on Thursday morning, a man was observed driving through the gate at Big Navy unauthorized. Access to all Naval Base Guam installations were immediately secured. The man has not been identified other than he is a civilian. Again, the case remains under investigation. Blue Ocean Law and the Unrepresented Nations and People's Organization filed a submission with the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Attorney Julian Uggen saying they're basically attempting to do what is very difficult work and that is taking the U.S. to task with respect to the various human rights implications of the current U.S. military buildup on Guam. The submission on behalf of Protehi Latexan, Sabertinian, brings Guam's movement further center of the international stage. It requests that the Special Rapporteur investigates harms related to the transfer of military forces and construction of the live fire training range complex, among other actions. Attorney Uggen says the filing 
is the first of its kind entering under the office of the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights based in Geneva. Maria Hernandez with Protehi Latexa noted the filing happens on the 75th year marking the U.S. bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Attorney General Levin Camacho joins a bipartisan coalition of 31 attorneys general urging the U.S. Senate to provide relief for all federal student loan borrowers impacted by COVID-19. The CARES Act provides ref- relief only to student loans owned by the federal government, excluding nearly 8 million borrowers whose federal student loans are owned by private entities. This relief is set to end on September 30th. From 2016 to 2019, thousands of students at the University of Guam received over $18.4 million in direct loans from the federal government. Camacho says the economic hardship of those with the student loan debt is not limited to people whose loans are owned by the federal government, adding, quote, that is why they are calling on Congress to ensure that all federal student loan borrowers receive relief and to consider long-term solutions for those living with student debt. And again, we go back into our Zoom room and bring in our Tomas Manglotnia with the latest regional headlines. Hi, Tomas. Good morning, Brian Chris. Here's the latest making news in the CNMI with containing COVID-19. Late last night, the CNMI governor's office reported another individual confirmed positive for COVID-19. They write in a press release that it was a CNMI resident who was screened upon arrival. They are in isolation facility at the Kunal Resort Hotel. This brings the CNMI's total case count to 47 since March. Of the now 47 cases on Saipan, 23 cases or about half of the recent ones have been identified as inbound travelers. The Commonwealth Healthcare Corporation is telling media that of the 23 confirmed cases identified through travel screening, 19 cases originated from the U.S. mainland, one from U.S. territory, and three from a foreign country. As we've reported, it has been weeks since the CNMI has seen a confirmed COVID case due to community spread. Meanwhile, the Commonwealth Healthcare Corporation also announcing that a traveler who has submitted a request to enter the CNMI for essential work is not approved immediately. They explain that essential work approval is based on epidemiological factors and strong work justification. Brian Chris, that's the latest making news with COVID-19 in the CNMI. Thanks, Tomas. In national news, President Trump has made misleading claims about children and the coronavirus as he pushes schools to reopen. Natalie Brandt has more details from the White House. Reporters press President Trump on his claim that children are almost immune from the coronavirus. All you have to do is read the newspapers or read the, read the medical reports. Facebook and Twitter took action after accounts connected to the president posted this clip. If you look at children, children are almost, and I would almost say definitely, but almost immune from this disease. The CDC says in the U.S., more than 250,000 children under the age of 17 have been infected. Studies do show they recover better than adults, but they can spread the virus to older people. President Trump has emphasized children are not as impacted by the virus as part of his push to reopen schools, which he says is critical for the economy to recover. This morning, the government announced nearly 1.2 million Americans filed new unemployment claims last week. That's down from the previous week, but there are still 16 million Americans receiving unemployment benefits. Our Republican counterparts refuse to acknowledge that Americans, through no fault of their own, have lost their jobs, might need some help, some money to help pay the rent. The White House has set a Friday deadline to reach an agreement on a new coronavirus relief package. If a deal is not reached, President Trump says his staff is preparing executive orders to address payroll tax cuts, eviction protections, unemployment extensions, and student loans. Natalie Brand, CBS News, the White House. Ohio Governor Mike DeWine tested positive for coronavirus this morning ahead of his meeting with President Trump. And that is your news. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it is 629. We'll take a short uh, break and we're coming back with uh, Mike Phillips from Mount Carmel School and we'll t- uh, talk with uh, Mike about uh, all the great things happening at Mount Carmel, uh, the safety measures with COVID and uh, how can you, you uh, sign your kids up there today at 630 on this Friday, the 7th day of August. Good morning, Juan. MDC primetime tonight. Kicks off. Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information.
We got your six. At 6 a.m. with the link on Breeze 93.9 FM. Bree and I connect you with all the latest news and information you need to know to start your day. Then check back with Guam's news leader at 6 p.m. for the day's top headlines with KUAM News Prime Time. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and everything else in between with KUAM Digital, we got your six. Marching through the table, you see the same old thing. And I pull up on the table, and the folk up in the pattern. And you better not complain. Once again, the Tremoro people produce a cover song that is better than the original. Special, on me. Right on. Iconic. Who doesn't get 
goosebumps when he starts doing that. Well, <laughs> well I ate a fork up in the pan. Uh, 636. Good morning. Good morning, Melissa. <laughs> Hey, it's the 7th day of August on a Friday. The link, The Breeze, 93.9. Good morning to our viewers on KUAM TV 11. Morning, morning, morning. Um, also, you can catch it on KUAM.com, the KUAM uh, news app. Uh, there's an audio stream, Docomo Channel 10. And last but not least, on the Edward R. Murrow award-winning social media networks of KUAM <laughs> on our Facebook live feed. Good morning. Good morning to all of you guys. Uh, it's 6.36. Let's uh, go to the phones. We have uh, Mike Phillips of Mount Carmel uh, School on the line to uh, talk about uh, their school year, which is... Good morning, Mike. Update Chris and uh, Bree and Jason. Good morning. Morning, Mike. Morning. Morning, morning. Well, thanks for uh, getting up uh, and washing your moogle with us this morning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just talk MCS, man. So uh, give us the status, Mike, on uh, when's your guys' first day of classes and... Uh, as we make this return to normalcy, how parents can uh, find out about everything that MCS has to offer and uh, enroll their kids there? Well, we uh, officially start August 11th. That's Tuesday. We have uh, orientation for both parents and, and uh, students on August 10th that uh, will, be, uh, uh, will be available all day long. Parents uh, will come at uh, different times, really, at their, at their convenience if they want to. But, you know, uh, Chris, since... Uh, Right before the pandemic and when the pandemic hit, we, uh, we added, and, and it continues to be a work in progress, that uh, additional dimension, which is the online distance learning. Okay. And we were actually scheduled to do that before um, the closure of the schools. And so we're very fortunate to, um, to be already working on that project, and, uh, and we've continued to work on it uh, since. So that's a, an element that we understand that uh, a lot of parents will choose and um, you know, we, we've heard recently um, it might be chosen for you if, um, if somebody's <laughs> testing positive. So you just kind of got to be ready for that. But we provide that option um, straight from the beginning. And we have a number of parents and families that have elected to, to do distance learning rather than um, what we also offer, which is five days in, in the traditional classroom setting. Are you seeing more people opting uh, for the remote learning or the distance learning as opposed to face-to-face? No, we're seeing a, a good number, but not a majority. Um, Bri, a majority are still uh, opting for face-to-face. But, of course, you know, the last few days may, may change things. But, no, right. uh, at least our numbers are a strong majority still prefer um, face-to-face. Mm-hmm. So when students return to, to campus on uh, August 11th, what are the changes that they're going to see? Well, they uh, obviously will start with uh, those who ride the bus. We have island-wide busing and uh, the, the buses, uh, although I don't know the... Uh, how they've staggered the seats it's obvious that they're yeah they're they don't know either mike don't worry we're, we're tracking that and they're still discussing it so. yeah well i think they're down to 24 right, right. for right. every 60 seats right so mm-hmm. everybody kind of has an idea of, of i think it's staggered on the left and the right and then yeah. every other seat on the left and the right i think that's what um, they can expect the 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 at the very beginning obviously when you get to the school it's the the sanitizing and making sure that everybody is screened and so uh, both of those will take place at the very front of the school, and, and we have a control center there. So um, students will, will uh, sanitize and at the same time be checked carefully to make sure that uh, there's no signs at all of, uh, of, uh, of COVID. And um, we um, continue and will um, um, obviously make sure that uh, each day um, parents are also screening their kids and, and you know their own families to make sure that uh, they're not high risk. But once they do that, then when they're in the class, that will take place regularly throughout the day. And um, the, uh, uh, the ability to, to ensure that if there was or is a, uh, um, a student that may, uh, may uh, at some point in the day later test positive, the control to be able to answer where the student was, who the student was with, that will also be controlled. But um, what we're also we're really trying to do is to provide the students with um, an education that is very close and consistent uh, to what they were doing before. So we will offer all our classes, um, at least right now, you know, they're all, they're all planned to, to go as scheduled. And, um, you know, we're not going to treat the kids like they're bunkered in, you know, um, a fallout shelter or anything like that. Um, we're trying to give them that, uh, that traditional classroom experience. And, and through that, Hopefully, they'll um, be able to get used to the masks, which they have to wear all day long. Right. And um, 
deal with teachers that are wearing masks and, and some of them maybe shields depending on the situation mm-hmm. um, and when they kind of get used to that hopefully uh, we don't know how long that would take but uh, when they get used to that being the norm for maybe a long while right now um, you know we we really uh, believe in you know Chris we we continue to to read all day long with, with regard to what the latest uh, steps and procedures are right. um, to to protect kids and protect our teachers right and their families um, and so whenever um, something else comes out, we'll make sure to, to do our very best to, to implement it. But right now, the, uh, the mask, the social distancing, the sanitizing, and the uh, kind of an interview, you know, um, in the sense of how the, the child is feeling and, you know, if there's anybody high risk, um, they may not be symptomatic. But uh, if we learn that, uh, that there's an issue in the family or, uh, or anything like that, then we'll treat that as a, you know, as a positive and uh and make sure that uh until um the student is uh is uh until we get the go ahead from from uh from a um a negative test um then we'll make sure to to isolate the student and we have a procedure for that we have a room to make sure that there's no um further contamination or or, or the spreading of the virus should anything like that happen mike uh you know one one thing that uh really uh, stands out at uh, mcs uh the academics you have sports and uh, the music and I'm, I'm curious uh what kind of measures you guys uh, uh put in place uh for uh, those uh programs that you have at uh, mcs well you know with uh with uh with music um that will that will go on but of course the the sanitizing um is a priority right. um we're, you got, we're I just like my man, Mike. I just had a big visual in my mind of like a drummer behind a big plexiglass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, and, and behind the plexiglass are the big uh, Tommy Lee Motley Crue thing where it lifts him up and then he starts spinning. And well, you know, the as I was as I was saying, the uh, and and everybody I think has heard this by now. That this uh, virus could be defeated in in four to six weeks if everybody just stayed six feet apart or, or wore a mask, right? right? Mm-hmm. And preferably both. And so. The, the beauty of that is, is uh, if you regulate that behavior and able to do that, you're really able to do a lot of things, almost everything. Um, it's just making sure that, like uh, you and Bree there, right, you, you guys are you're wearing your mask, and, uh, and even, God forbid, uh, one of you had the virus, you would not give it to, to the other person. And uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we need to control. Yeah, we can't uh, we can't control what goes on in the homes, but we can control we can control to a large extent what goes on at school. And if we can prevent that, then everybody can feel um, safe, you know. Uh, and and that's our goal. And like I said, um, you know, our online program is uh, is really dynamic because we understand that uh, you know the our most parents are are not trained in education, and even if uh, some of them may have taken certain classes and might be able to understand themselves. Being able to teach their kids and, and having the patience to do it hmm. are, are two separate things. And so we're, we're trying to develop uh, further um, our online program that, uh, that entertains the students and realize, um, you know, always that um, you can't compare with the teacher in, in the classroom. And so hmm. if you're just going to give them the work, um, some call that online. We don't call that online. That's, uh, that's not online. That's just simply, you know, giving them work. You've got to find a way to... to, to um, to uh, to teach and and we've got to find a way for for the students to learn they're not they're not real hip or real used to learning online they're they're used to kind of i mean i'll use the the uh, the four letter word play right they're mm. used to playing online right. and so you're using that that uh, mechanism of uh, communication and and it's turning to a real serious um uh, mode of learning and and uh, they're not going to adjust to that real easily so we have to and that's what we're working on right now we'll also have um between two to four uh distance learning counselors available all day long um for parents and uh and is it if the parents have, they parents. call in and they got questions about the online uh, assignments absolutely that, all right mm-hmm. and a lot of a lot of that stuff Chris, well good people idea people like me mm-hmm. it's like well how do you turn on the computer <laughs> what do you do next <laughs> and, uh, i know it says just do this oh it's upside down yeah, mm-hmm. just, yeah, it's just uh, new, you know, for, yeah. for a lot and for parents. So yep. we have that in place, and, and um, they can use that even if they are um, a family that's participating in our in-class um, side of the school. You know, either way, it's there to, to benefit all parents that, uh, that enroll their children at Mount Carmel. Mm-hmm. And, and speaking of enrollment um, and registration, I understand you guys have uh, an incentive program? We have, uh, we have a number of programs, but uh, 
One of them, I think, are, are most popular for the middle school. Um, involves uh, public school students that are coming over. We have uh, financial aid, of course, but we have a scholarship program for the top public school students that come over. And, and um, through that program, I think more than anything else, we've been able to attract many, many um, top public school um, students to come down. Our curriculum is uh, different. It's uh, much more broad. Um, you take many more classes. Um, from fourth grade up, you take Latin. And that used to be uh, the norm here in both public and private school. And, and then it, uh, like I think music and, and other classes, uh, um, cost got in the way. And so they started to cut back in those classes. But uh, those are also the classes that complete uh, the education for children. And uh, we've seen in the research, those are also the types of classes like physical education and things like that, that um, contribute in the long run to, to, uh, um, to further development of, of children. And so when they leave your school, um, if you have a background in Latin, our kids, um, some of them will have four or five years of Latin by the time they've left. Um, when they go on to high school and especially college, they have such a great advantage. But when you talk to a lot of people that are in their uh, maybe late 60s and, and went to school in the 60s, they'll tell you whether it was public school or private school, um, whether it's GW or Mount Carmel, they were taking Latin. And it was just a, a fundamental part of education back then because Latin's a fundamental part of English. Mm -hmm. And so, like, music's, uh, you know, a, a very serious part of being a human. Um, you know, if you're, if you're going to um, educate the complete child as we strive to do, that is our, our mission, then you're going to have to offer those courses and find a way to do it. Right. Of course, we still have all, the, all our, uh, our regular uh, courses that are, that are offered by other schools, but in addition to that, we have tomorrow and Latin and... Uh, I think most people understand the, the seriousness of our music program and right. our physical education program, and of course our, our um, religion program. Right, Mike. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, just real quick, before we uh, close? Info or if people want to family, wanna, the yeah, family referral, the, the family referral program. This is something yeah, I think is the, great. Right. Uh, you keep in mind that you know we want our uh, kids to go to school together, and uh, maybe sometimes right. that's not feasible because of the cost. And you guys actually right. have a: the yeah. more you enroll, the less you pay. That's correct. Per child, it, it goes down. Um, in fact, after your third child, we don't we don't charge monthly tuition um, for your fourth and fifth and or, or sixth um, from the same family because we want yeah. to encourage families. That's called the Chris Barnett plan. plan. <laughs> <laughs> See, after well, the the uh, the, uh, the financial aid is available um, to to those who need, but uh, the tuition program is is designed to really encourage a second and a third child from right. the same family to uh, to come. So we do that. Even even the students that may receive a scholarship, um, you know, we try to help um, them bring because um, that that often happens, uh, mostly happens in the middle school, and parents want to bring um, maybe a second and a third grader over, um, you know, in that very first year, and we encourage that, and so that's why we have those very favorable uh, tuition rates. But the the family referral program, um, Chris, is for new families, and uh, it's open to anybody, students and and parents. That, that make that referral receive $100 for, for families that register. Right. Okay. Okay, Mike. That register. Yeah. Uh, hey, right, guys. Thanks a lot, Mike. My boy went to Mount Carmel, well-rounded education. He went from homeschooling right into Mount Carmel and, uh, just, you know, the social interaction, uh, more, more importantly, the academics and uh, uh, the music program, uh, too, I, I think gave him a, a well-rounded education that uh, prepared him for, I mean, he's been doing really great in high school, Mike. So uh, thank, thank you guys uh, for that. And it's 565-5128. Three eight two two, or you send an email to communications at Mount Carmel Guam dot com. Mike, thank you. Thank you, guys. All right, stay Have safe. Good morning. Wear your That's mask. Us. Wash your hands. Wash your thumbs. All right, don't forget the thumbs, man. Yep. Especially you hitchhikers. <laughs> We're at six forty nine. Let's stay in the Zoom room here and uh, get on um, Doctor Vince Akimoto. Good morning, Doc. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. Wow, it looks lovely. Where are you, where are you at right now? I'm trying to get ready to go to work, but uh, uh, had to comb my hair, hair, so taking me some time. <laughs> How's my hair? Well, I love that wind in your hair look uh, this morning. <laughs> wind blown. Yeah. Uh, Doc, so, yeah. man, you've been uh, pretty busy. I know that uh, there was a whole bunch of developments that happened in the last week, um, and uh, you've been kind of uh, making some noise about uh, public health contact tracing, and so I guess... Uh, just we'll start there. Um, do you believe the Department of Public Health and Social Services is doing, is doing an adequate job of contact tracing uh, these uh, COVID-19 positive cases? No, no I, I think they're doing an incredible job. The, the, the very few people 
at the Department of Public Health who are qualified to do this very sophisticated medical detective work to, tr to contract down the increasing number of positive uh, people, especially those who are coming from overseas, from, from the mainland United States and from the Philippines, those people are doing incredible work and have been doing it for the last four months. And many of them are exhausted. They have other jobs. Um, some of them are in charge of our tuberculosis surveillance program, our dengue fever program, our lab. Uh, they have other jobs. And yet they've been for the last four months single-handedly holding up our economy and it can't continue in this way. So if the legislature and the governor are awake now, um, and if they're not, somebody should go wake them up. Hmm. They should pay attention to Hawaii because that's what happens when you fail. Hawaii made all these promises to its people and to its businesses that it was gonna reopen to Japan. Uh, that ain't gonna happen. They are now among the worst in the nation in terms of failing to control their borders. They have a greater than 200% rise in cases over the past few weeks. Two more people died yesterday, and so they have almost 30 deaths uh, from COVID-19. And, and this is terrible. Every death matters, particularly in a disease that some people say is just a bad flu. Mm -hmm. But the flu kills. And unfortunately, this is the bad news for today. It's flu season. We're about to get whacked by the flu. And dengue fever wants to start back up again too. So if anybody thinks that we need to stay status quo with the public health budget, if anybody thinks that the government of Guam did a great job of keeping us safe and by having a hospital that fails accreditation and doesn't have enough ICU beds for this surge, they're idiots. And so every Senator, every governor listening on Guam today needs to understand that we are now getting hit with the same surge that brought Hawaii down. We don't, we simply don't have enough ICU beds. We have tons of ventilators. We have tons of machines. We have tons of medicine. And that's a credit to some people that have been working hard. We don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough doctors. So if you wanna open this economy, if you want to start giving people their jobs back and people going back to school, we need contact tracers. We need to do the things, the basic science things that have been working everywhere else. Don't make this up. You, you're not that good. Mm -hmm. You know, this hand washing and everybody staying home in place and acting like there's a super typhoon. You know, that's a great way to kill the economy and ruin our culture, right? Because, I, you know, I haven't seen my mom in like three weeks. I told her three weeks ago that this surge was going to happen because of idiots coming from Hawaii running around like they, they, you know, that it's their business if they go and kiss all the old people in the Tupis community. We have a really big problem right now because the people that are working are exhausted and the legislature thinks that it's fine to keep a budget that funds 5,000 unnecessary people. I, I, I can't make this any more clear. You're an idiot if you think that your budget that you're going to fight over next week is going to save Guam. We need more nurses. We need more contact tracers. We need to have a more robust system that responds to schools that have positives in less than one day. You shut down a school that has one positive case because you can't get enough public health help in on that day. So, you know, again, make it clear. The reason why all these businesses are shutting down, the reason why our economy is gonna get uh, bombed is because of the legislature's failure to prioritize public health to prioritize education and to prioritize public safety. They want to fund idiots. So again, I, I, I'm sorry about my hair. Is it, is it still okay? Yeah, your hair yeah. is great. It, it shrunk a little when you said idiots, though. I felt that passion there. That was like a teeth gritter. You're like, idiot. Yeah, it's close. Can you, can you call some of the senators? Because I'd we like to see if they peed in their pants. Try to put the, the, the camera right where they pee. Because... Uh. You know, they, they think they did something great. Mm -hmm. They all sheltered in place. They, they confirmed that they're non-essential and they let the governor and her people do all the work. And then they come in and criticize and start having all these oversight hearings. Mm -hmm. This I is their time to shine, right? The budget hearing is the only thing we pay them to do. They control the purse strings. And they told us this week that they think everything's great. We're gonna to continue to fund everything. We're gonna freeze all the positions and we can't hire any more nurses. We can't hire any more contact tracers. And we're gonna keep all the special project coordinators 
We're going to keep the 200 people that GMH hired during this pandemic. None of them were nurses. There are 1,300 people on the GMH payroll today. None of them are nurses. Because if they were, I wouldn't be complaining about the fact that if when we go through this weekend and we get five more ICU patients, when we get five more ICU patients, if we do, right, and we've got lots of positives and lots of idiots walking around with uh, breaking, breaking uh, quarantine like they're not supposed to, right, and other people that are sick and they're scared to get tested because they don't want to lose their business, you know, again, the government needs to step up. But our hospital didn't suddenly magically get better since March. Mm-hmm. Our hospital didn't suddenly become, you know, so good that the governor was going to put any money in to renovate the, the elevators. She said it's too, it's hopeless to fix our hospital. Lillian Fasadas, the hospital administrator, says she wants to build a new hospital and she's given up on our current hospital. So how confident are you as we go through this surge? Hawaii is in tears right now. They're on their knees. Mm-hmm. Their ICU beds are quickly filling up. Their lieutenant governor, who's a, go- who's a doctor, is saying that they're going to need to shut down again for another month. Mm-hmm. Lock down like the way it was before. Curfew, no businesses, no flights, no nothing. And this is on the back of the Guam legislature, which is doing a budget right now that's only there, I suppose, to keep their primo and prima in business, right? To keep them home watching Netflix. <laughs> this is your fault, buddy. Doc, this I got- is your fault because you, you can't budget for a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Doc, I got to ask this because, you know, you come on the air. um, I get some of your messages. And, you know, what we get in response is a message from the Joint Information Center. And it is do not believe unverified information. Right. And and guess what? I mean, we kind of know who. All of it's verifiable. You know what? They were contesting (laughs) the fact that we told you how many were in the ICU. Yeah. And how many were in the ICU. Exactly how much we said. What's infuriating more than this, right, is the Joint Information Center has yet to acknowledge that the Chukis community is in pain. The Chukis community is scared out of their mind. So, you know, the Joint Information Center should just change their acronym to the CDC because they are full of shit. Oi. <laughs> okay. Uh, Doc, we did have a cast of uh, Nakam- uh, uh, Cash Cash Nakamura. From, yeah, from the Chukis Association of Guam on yesterday to to give a message out to the community because um, you're right, they're very concerned about uh, the spread of COVID-19 and um, they wanted to just put the word out to remind everybody to to do the things that help avoid the spread of uh, this disease. But going back to what Sabrina said, Doc, it is very frustrating when we get these messages and of course, as a legitimate media source, we want to vet the information, we want to make sure it's accurate, but the problem is we hear it from so many different people, but when we take it to the government officials, they shut it down and they say, oh, don't share verified messages. And then we find out two, three days later that those um, so-called unverified messages are actually true. Mm-hmm. It's frustrating. Uh, and I don't know it's, if it's, it's they're like just they're, being... They're not in the intensive care unit, but they're in the COVID care unit three receiving intensive care right. uh, le- level unit Care. You see how confusing that is? So if you ask, oh, how many are in the ICU? And they'll be like, oh, nobody's in the ICU, um, but they're receiving ICU level treatment in another part of the hospital. But hey, that's not the ICU. And I just think it's a little, um, and, 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 it's disingenuous. And, and they say, let's, yeah, they say, let's not talk about it, even though one of the parameters, right, mm-hmm. for us being able to safely reopen our community is going to be how well run are our hospital beds and especially our ICU beds. Mm-hmm. If you notice, the JIC or whatever the hell their name is, they never mention how many hospital beds we have or how many ICU beds are being utilized because they every time they do, they have to acknowledge that we fail. On a national level, our community fails. Mm-hmm. We're, we're full, our ICU beds are full, not of COVID-19, but, for, but from people that have been playing around with ice and have blown out their brains and so they have these massive strokes and we have to try to save their life. They're, they're, they're full because people are in dialysis, and they've got some weird infection that we need to save their life. Where they're full because people are having heart attacks. It's not a good time to have COVID-19. And so the, the JIC needs to get off their butt this morning. And I hope they're peeing in their pants again because they're being called out. You're not telling the people of Guam the truth. Our hospital situation is critical to us reopening safely. If you're going to let the children go to school, if you're going to say everything's fine, then be honest about the hospital situation. What is your plan for the surge? 
What is your plan when 10 more ICU patients come in to, to keep company? The one guy who's been in there, you know, ever since it got leaked out by the Chukis community themselves. The Chukis community are themselves speaking about this. This is no secret. Right, right. This is not a HIPAA violation. <laughs> this is nothing like that. HIPAA has no C in it. HIPAA means information portability. It's designed to help share important medical information so we can save lives. This government is acting like a bunch of Gestapo communists using information as a weapon. They don't want you to know the truth. And they're muzzling our media, KUAM, from getting the truth on the day it happens. So you have to hear about it as a rumor two or three days later and then get criticized for asking the tough questions why didn't they just give you the answer on the first day? Mm. But again, this is about, you know, the media um, needing to realize that, you know, they don't like you. They don't want you <laughs> to tell the truth. Oh, I realized that a long time ago. <laughs> I don't give a damn. You know, I'm here to be like, I don't give a damn. Actually, I prefer Chris, it if you hate haircut. me. <laughs> you get a good haircut like me, they like you. Yeah, all right. I would no, let it grow out a little. Stop. <laughs> I, I wanted to ask, though, because you, you were criticizing the, the legislature, the administration, about um, not hiring nurses and, and medical professionals. Um, what would your response be that, you know, there's a shortage, that it's hard to difficult, it's difficult to, to hire nurses because there just aren't any out there? Then why do they have two emergency sessions about a stupid election, a, a primary election? They haven't had an emergency session about trying to find nurses or contact tracers or anything to do with the pandemic you know i don't know what the answer is oh actually I, i'm sorry i know what the answer is let's vote a whole bunch of new people in because these guys don't know what they're doing okay next all right. question all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well we've got the budget you chair know, uh, yeah, coming on yeah, so we'll ask him yeah it's if there's crickets and i hope the budget chair is listening right we need contact tracers and we don't need to rob the general fund. There's $4.4 million in federal funds right. that Guam has already received for testing and contact tracing. Mm -hmm. And we have businesses now scrambling, trying to find money to test their own staff being told by JIC that they're not, that these tests won't get paid for by the government of Guam because it's for business purposes. What do we pay the GRT for, for the privilege of doing business on Guam? Or is it for the privilege of the budget chair having slush money so he can keep 5,000 non-essential employees going on during the middle of a pandemic? You're an idiot. Bring them on. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Doc. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Th yeah, thank you so much for coming on, Doc. Mm -hmm. uh, love the hair. Uh, thank you for the fiery words. Uh, and, you know, he's... Keeping it real. Sorry, sorry about the roosters. They're all, all my roosters are waking up. They're crowing right along <laughs> with you. <laughs> yeah, so Doc, yeah, I appreciate they're, they're it. They're mad yeah. at the budget chair. Tell them they're mad at the budget chair. <laughs> now that they're unemployed, <clears throat> they didn't get no uh, stimulus. <clears throat> they lost the cockfighting bill. All right, guys. Thank Go you, Doc. Stop. Yeah. You, don't take no for an answer and quit getting muzzled. <laughs> Stay safe. Wash your hands and your thumbs and wear your mask. All right, uh, Dr. Vince Sakimoto. Yeah, it's frustrating, and of course he's talking about this. Um, he w there was messages uh, going around, yeah. and we were slapped on the hand, and yeah. we were told, "Oh, don't share this unverified information." How dare you? Mm -hmm. uh, only share official messages that take five days to come out. Information failure, all the way. Unfortunate. We just talked about this uh, yesterday. They're they're you're, he's right. They use information as a weapon. Mm -hmm. They hold it, and they, they try and make you wait it out. And I think the thinking is that, oh, if we just don't answer it or we say it's a rumor or three days, it's just going to go away. Yeah. yeah. And specifically with this uh, incident, we had the Chukis Association of Guam on them. They were saying it themselves. When we asked Dr. Maglotnia, she said, hey, if they're telling you guys, then it's mm -hmm. verified. Mm -hmm. But why do we have to wait a week and a half to hear it from our, our government? That's the thing. If we're really trying to save lives, then we do. We need to hire these contact tracers. And, you know, Dr. Akimoto's right. Is the, we don't, the contact tracers a lot of times aren't coming on the same day. You know what I mean? They, mm -hmm. they don't, uh, we're, we're getting the positives, and we don't have enough contact tracers. I mean, 
Well, well, we got them coming on uh, in a bit, and I'm sure they heard that call. So uh, we'll get Annette uh, Uggen and uh, Vince Uggen from Public Health uh, Contact Tracing uh, Division. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep it in the Zoom room now and move on, switch gears a little bit uh, from Island Girl Power. I wanted to bring on Juanita Blas. Uh, good morning, Juanita. Happy Friday. Hi, Juanita. Good morning. Well, everybody's outside this morning. I'm so jealous. <laughs> Um, I figured I'd be outdoors because if I'm over there, then it's too close to the traffic. Right. Yeah. And I, I wanted to bring you on. We'll we'll get to the the programs and stuff. But there was something I saw where you were um, trying to get some monetary donations to keep the Island Girl Power thrift store open. And when I saw that, I said, "Man, we got to get you on because you guys do such great work uh, in the community." And before this whole future is Famalau and stuff, Island yep. Girl Power has been there in the villages. Uh, promoting empowerment for you know since the young, ever since, since, ever since yeah. dude before the t-shirts before everything right so 20th, 20th anniversary right so for 20 years and when i saw that your thrift store was in uh, danger i just had to give you the floor so just uh juanita we will give you the floor you tell us what we need to do and how people can help out there absolutely um you know there's only a handful of volunteers that come in um two three days a week and um, we got to get the thrift store uh, into a better condition so that we can open. We haven't been open since COVID um, and people, you know, they want to donate. They, they want to donate, but we can't accept any donations. We were overloaded to begin with. The facility is small. Um, we have to, you know, practice new uh, sanitation requirements and everything because donations coming in need to be able to be uh, sanitized no matter what, no matter who it's coming from. And and that's a hard message for the community to take, um, but we have very little space, but we've had to keep the air cons on, we've had to keep the center functioning um, or everything will mold and the equipment will get bad. So the power bills, the water bills, the phone bills keep going but our revenue, that thrift store, has been closed. So so what are you asking people to do? Just oh, make monetary sorry. donations? Um, online donations, mm-hmm. yes. Um, oh. Online donations on our website. So we haven't set up any um, crowdfunding or, or fundraisers of that sort, but we do have a PayPal on our website, www.islandgirlpower.com. And uh, there's a donate button, simple, old school, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, and the uh, when they do make the donation, uh, the name of the organization is Continental Micronesia Medical Missions, because that's the original name of a Judah Foundation. Right, right. Um, a Judah was started as a medical missions mm-hmm. uh, program for for Micronesia. Yeah. I want you to give us an idea of how much money you need to raise to get you in the clear. Um, well, you know, um, we've been uh, we've been able to do fundraisers with plant sales and right. wonderful uh, partners partners that have been donating. Um, but our our average bills for the month, I think, come out to about two thousand dollars a month. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, it's just it's just a matter of keeping the utilities going um, until we can get a handle on the thrift store opening again and when we open it's probably going to be for a couple days a week because you know even our volunteers the numbers are rising of covid again and those are priceless very priceless valuable volunteers and um they're they're just as nervous about everything i'm on is sang song road and this is real this this (laughs) this sirens all the time right yeah (laughs) So what about the programs? Are you guys still um, offering programs to the girls? Or are you guys closed? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can you give us a report? You see anything over there? What's going on? Everything's okay. It's just passing. Are those the cop ambulance. cars or ambulance? Ambulance, okay. No, the ambulance, ambulance. You know, it's the ambulance. Right, you gotta, you gotta make, make the sure sign of the cross. Yeah, board, I know. Say. Man, they took um, me so back I'm to sorry. my... sorry, what was that? <laughs> Sabrina, uh, what were you saying? Programs. Uh, yeah, are, are you guys still are up, your programs still up and running? Well, um, we've uh, done a lot of uh, changing of of how we facilitate our projects. Um, we did a lot during COVID. We handed out uh, man, it was about 
more than 250 jump ropes at the fence line. So families will just, you know, hear about it online, drive up, pick up jump ropes for their kids, cool. little family activity kits. Um, we are we are neck deep in plants and um, we've been giving away planting kits, uh, live life happy garden. Um, it's a way of just helping people with the, the social and emotional stress that they're going through with COVID. Um, you know, taking care of plants is a good thing. It's cathartic. Um, and uh, we also have women that um, donate the masks, make masks and, and uh, donate them to us. Right. Half is for a fundraiser and then the other half, um, more than half we give away. Right. Um, and we've been doing that since the, since the beginning of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, there's other things we're doing. We packed up uh, more than 150 boxes of items because merchandise has to rotate. These are really good items that we're giving uh, and we're donating it to, to uh, um, the Chuk, uh, Chuk Islands, right. uh, Polat and Uman, and uh, also the Chukis Women's Association. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we haven't been able to actually get the shipment out, um, but we donate on a regular basis to the outer islands. Juanita doing this, uh, you know, 20 years, right. Uh, just being there in the village level, uh, being there for the young women, uh, empowering them, uh, teaching them the self-respect and, and giving them all the, all the tools they need uh, to really kind of prosper and, and grow into um, outstanding members of our community. After 20 years, when you reach a point like this where it's just so tough and, and you're looking at, you know, services and, and there's just a cash crunch, how do you keep going? You know, it's it's kind of, um, uh, we've been at, we've been, we've been here before, before. Um, our organization, you know, Ajuda, we operate on bare bones. Um, you know, we get the support from the community when there's a crisis, um, we function. We know how to downsize um, between grants, and honestly, the between grants parts is really long periods of time. Um, but we keep ourselves um, as happy as possible, um, doing things um, for the community. Really, just it. There's nothing like it. Um, myself, this place has been a healing place for me. Um, the community gardens remained open, so I'd still be able to see the gardeners coming in and out and taking care of their plants. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a community of people that want to be really, really positive and happy. And, um, and so, you know, being surrounded by those kind of people, you can't help but just be okay. Um, times are tough. Um, I hate asking for money. Um, but, uh, you know, it, I, this is a point where it has to happen and the call out has to go, you know, if you want to support Island Girl Power and our Kurosone Seng Song Center and our Maleso location, um, those donations are greatly appreciated. Maleso Island Girl Power will be opening. Um, Sandy Yee is heading that and she said in maybe about a month um, or less. And they're getting ready to open out of the Cook School in uh, the pier. Oh, Juanita, you got me there. You know, uh, I just can't stress enough how much uh, really the young the young women in our uh, island need, you know, people like you to be looking out for them. I mean, there's just so many uh, factors that put them at risk growing up on, on, on this uh, island. And, man, I just can't thank you enough because I was just thinking going way back. I mean, 20 years, uh, you've been doing it, and you're still here. And to just hear that, that the happiness you bring these young women and, and their families is what keeps you going. God, you got, I'm trying not to cry. I don't know if it's the COVID, no, but I need to Chris, go work for waterworks. Yeah, Cause this... it. it's, it's good. It's mm -hmm. good tears, Chris. There's been too many bad tears. So the thing about it also is you got to remember six years ago in 2014, we expanded our facility is four buildings in Dededo. We also accept donation. Uh, what, what is it? Uh, volunteers for probation, community service, and we accept service learning students and we take uh, CWEP and jobs program volunteers. So our girls program is absolutely the core, but there's so much more that we do for the community nowadays, you know, restoring neighborhood parks, helping with the nature park right 
in the mm-hmm. back. There's an 11 acre na- nature park. So there's so much more that we do for the community, but with all under the premise of raising young girls, teaching the community how to how to how to speak to women, how to how to treat um, the females in their family, um, proper conduct, consent, you know, um, sexual assault prevention. We do a lot more for the general community than most people realize. Well, I know uh, from personal experience uh, mm-hmm. what what you did for my goddaughter. Um, you were definitely the organization um, really had a positive uh, impact on her life before uh, she passed away. And I know I've done ver- so many stories with with you, and especially with the public parks. Um, what you guys do is um, amazing. So hopefully, people yeah. who are listening. Um, please, you know, go to islandgirlpower.com uh, and, and make a donation. It is to a truly uh, worthy and deserving uh, program. Right. I mean, <laughs> you hear that all the time. It's a great cause. It's a thousand million percent true in, in this case, Juanita. And so yeah. that I, and gr- islandgirlpower.com. Because she couldn't figure out the GoFundMe, what you told me yesterday. You were like, I don't know how to do I the need, deck. I need people. I need people with <laughs> the technology side. Because, oh. you know, I'm out here moving boxes and planting plants. Yeah. That, that fundraising side has always been a little yeah. a little bit of a challenge right. for me. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, wouldn't be asking if we didn't need it. That's for sure. And we wouldn't be putting you on here if we didn't think you needed it. So thank, mm-hmm. thank you, Juanita. Thanks, Juanita. Yes, thank you so much. All thank right. you safe. so much for the time. Uh, okay. God bless you. Wash Bye-bye. your hands. Bye. Yeah, wear your mask. Yeah, I got to sport my earrings because I don't have to have a mask Ooh. right now. Let's <laughs> see them. What kind of earrings you got there? It's spongeless, nah. of course. It's Beautiful. a spongeless stack. Yeah, yeah, day. Thanks. <laughs> okay, Juanita. Bye, okay, Juanita. Bye, Juanita. That's that. Again, that's www.islandgirlpower.com. Jason? Yeah, actually, we, we threw the uh, link in there for those of you uh, watching. Even if you're watching on TV or listening on the radio, yeah, you know you can hit up the, uh, the URL. It's islandgirlpower.com slash donate.html. But we've also put it in uh, the comment stream. For those of you watching right now, please consider donating. Because I wanted to share something about like Juanita real, real quick. Is I've, I have had the great pleasure of interviewing uh, Juanita Blas. I've come to know her as a friend, you know, not just a contact, not just someone, you know, who wants interviews from us. I've probably interviewed her a couple dozen times on KUM News Extra over the years. And every single time I see her, I'm like, hey, so, you know, how's your day? Where are you coming from? She's like, oh, I just came from the clubhouse. I'm doing the interview <laughs> yeah. with you. See, yeah. she's still on the Zoom call. She's laughing yeah. right now. Yeah. And as soon as she's done, she said, then I got to go down to Melissa. Right. Then I got, then a, board, I gotta go, I got yeah. a board meeting. We right, got a public yeah. hearing. Or, and then you know, we got a jump rope thing. I <laughs> have run into her at least, what, what, Juanita, like six or seven times at Payless. <laughs> and she'd be like, okay, I'm picking up stuff for the clubhouse. And then I got to go back. Yeah. Got a, har, hardest working woman yeah. in community service. Yeah. Uh, oh, it, okay. This is why I love Zoom. We got a live video feed of her, you guys, right now, and she's blushing. Yeah, and she she's is. very, very humble. And I know she doesn't like us talking about her, uh, <laughs> but but she 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 truly. I mean, that yeah. is the spirit and the core of who she is, and she loves Guam. I've got a personal connection to that because she's on Sing Song Road. You know, like I went to school there. I went to Maria Ujoa. Oh, she might be tearing right now. Um, but Juanita, we love you. We thank you. We're in awe of your can, boundless energy. Can we get energy. her back on? Yeah, let's get her. We'll, we'll just get to Juanita. Thank oh, okay. you for not hanging up yet, but we're sorry. Oh, here she is. She's oh, Juanita. You're back on with us and everything like that. So we just want to say, you know, we, we truly appreciate. Hey, come on now. <laughs> we truly appreciate what what you do because I mean, you are really an angel of mercy in in this community, and you are such an inspiration to so many people. But yeah, I mean, and that's the kind of that's the kind of thing you cannot you cannot train for. You cannot learn. That is just part of who you are. She, we, You're absolutely genuine. I know we, we had her on as a COVID hero, but yeah. I- in reality, she's an everyday hero. Right. So. Yeah. Thanks, Juanita. Okay, now we're going to hang Thank up for real, guys. okay? Thank you, guys. <laughs> Too much. Thank you. Okay, can stop now. Okay. Thank you. Because knowing Juanita, she's going to be, guys, i got to yeah. get back to work. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Again, www.islandgirlpower.com. All right, we'll take a short break, and uh, we're coming up next with the Department of Public Health and Social Services contact tracing team. 
Right here on the link. It's the Breeze 93.9 Friday. Good morning, Guam. For summer DIY. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. We got your six. At 6 a.m. with the link on Breeze 93.9 FM. Bree and I connect you with all the latest news and information you need to know to start your day. Then check back with Guam's news leader at 6 p.m. for the day's top headlines with KUAM News Primetime. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and everything else in between with KUAM Digital, we got your six. Good morning, Guam. Friday, Viva Wear your masks. Wash your hands. I think we need to bring back the stay home. What do you think? Very concerning uh, news yesterday with uh, just a. It was just one after another, Sabrina. Yeah, well, what, almost 40 cases this week o- alone. Right, and then we had, it started, uh, I woke up to a notice from Father Duaneus, uh Memorial School that they had a member of the school community uh, test positive. They, uh, you know, shifted everyone to online, mm-hmm. um, and then it was cross restaurant. Mm-hmm. Then we saw Proa, Proa. Calvo Select Care, um, GPA, Underwater World, um, what? Three. Oh, Carbolito Elementary. Right, Carbolito Elementary. Um, what we, yeah. like we're missing the camera. <laughs> I want to say three oh, squares. Oh, three squares. Three, three squares, squares, yeah. yeah. Um, and, then, and, and all of these businesses, they came forward. Right, they right, were the ones right. who, who told, you know, advised the community. Um, oh, Benson. Benson. And Benson. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I was actually just in Benson the day. Uh, so that came out yesterday. I was there mm-hmm. uh, the day before. Buying jars for Denancy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I talked to Manito Co. and he he said that uh, it was Tuesday night uh, when they were informed by the employee and the indi- the the employees on the second floor right. uh, of the building didn't have any contact with the uh, customers, um, and the employee had attended a uh, a family gathering. Um, there was a funeral uh, in the family, and um, you know they prayed for. 
you know they were felt for the fam for yeah. for their for the employee um but you know he assured uh me and assures customers that they have been you know sanitizing disinfecting on the daily and you know are, are going to be uh wor- working with public health to determine close contacts Right, and let's uh, just go ahead and uh, get right to it and bring up uh, from the Department of Public Health and uh, Social Services. They are the contact tracers. I know we hear that all the time, and these are the faces behind uh, those titles. We have Annette uh, Uggen and Vince um, Uggen from DPHSS, and the it's the Communicable, uh, communicable uh, Disease uh, Division, right? And so you guys are basically yeah. contact tracers. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Vince. Good morning, um, Annette. Good morning. Good morning. Is, is that your primary job, or you guys have other uh, responsibilities? We have other responsibilities, mm-hmm. but under the Bureau of Communicable Disease Control, uh, we are responsible for uh, case investigation and contact tracing of notifiable diseases. Right. Uh, even when it's a, a novel one like um, COVID, because it does uh, have um, the urgency of being outbreak prone uh, mm-hmm. it causes a uh, it's a disease of public health concern right. and so uh that is the bureau we're under vince is actually the acting supervisor for the std hiv viral hepatitis program uh, but uh due to their training as disease intervention specialists they have been pulled pulled over to help with the covid response okay let me just ask you when we got you on the line the first question i have is why is it that we hear from um these businesses about uh, their their covid 19 positive cases why don't we hear that coming from uh, public health first well these these businesses have actually stepped up and and partnered with us and they wanted to be the one to go out and inform uh their patrons their employees we we talk to them behind the scenes uh and again we are also mindful of not having uh negative backlash to these individuals uh there have been some concerns and complaints and you there's a varying opinion of some businesses don't don't put my name out there don't put mm-hmm. our name out in in the in the public other businesses are no we want to do it and so they are the ones who put forth the press release to notify their individuals so uh you know we have to take both both sides and work with them as best we can uh, again <laughs> we we work with the employee uh, the individual who be it an employee who identified where they work and we do work with them to say you know please inform your employer because if we're giving you that courtesy if not we will have to inform your employer that you know of the there was a possibility of exposure in the workplace so in the instance of these businesses who say oh no 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 don't put our name out there i mean how do you guys kind of leverage the the need for people to know because when we talk about contact tracing if there's a positive at a business and they don't want their name put out there i mean how do you find out who is does it make your job that much harder and also um don't you think that we have a responsibility and uh, uh, to tell the public about the risk and the dangers uh when these businesses that are open have somebody who tests positive for COVID-19 yes we have the responsibility uh to do that but also to balance uh the prevention of undue panic and fear so each case is investigated thoroughly, and we have to look at the the setup of that business, uh, the establishment, the function, uh, because what if the employee was working in the back room and never went to the front? So there's no exposure to the customers, um, it's, and, and it's only the employee, other uh, fellow employer employees. So those are the situations that we have to look at. Um, you could say you went into the business in the morning, but the person doesn't work until the night shift. So there was no interaction with those customers so again we're trying to narrow down the day the time the shift uh where are you located in the specific building in the business or the establishment and what is your interaction with other co-workers and is there, are there any customers that come into your establishment and what is your interaction if any and so yeah. those are the things that our team does in the background mm. to narrow down again focusing on the close contacts and we work our way out because there is a lot of concern because yes we're a small island and you hear a lot of this well i was in contact to a person who works there that's considered a contact to a contact your risk is low for this situation so we need to focus on those who are definitely exposed and in close contact i i I just wonder if you could clarify like with the air force uh, situation there was like a list of 30 businesses i can't even remember the exact number 
but we let the community know or public health let the community know like look these airmen uh this is where they may have went and it was just all over the place um and then even uh the division of environmental health uh, they provide updates to the community uh, in terms of the COVID-19 uh, inspections, whether they are found any violations um, at specific uh, eateries or whether they didn't. And they also release information on their sanitation inspections and they shut down uh, restaurants and, and, and venues. So I don't see why uh, public health can't or yeah your division can't do the same because if we've seen it before we're just wondering why we don't it's not consistent and if the precedent was set in that instance those instances is so the situation with the establishments the list of establishments that went out with the air force that ended up causing undue panic across the island we had numerous people calling public health i was there two weeks ago uh you know I, I came to just pick up food but i didn't stay inside and so those are the things that is not put out in the media that we are dealing with in the back end uh and trying to allay people's fears right. because we did have that where we had this surge of calls and people wanting to come in and be tested which added more um challenges to our team to focus on the priorities and then to, to because of that you know pointing out that is those lists of establishment we didn't have any connection for, to those air force uh, service members who went to those establishment to any local cases right. and so again that's all done in the back end mm -hmm. and trying to really narrow down was there true exposure right. there was several establishment oh it was just pick up at the window mm -hmm. but then we had numerous residents so i went there i ate the there um, if I may add, so this yeah, is yeah, Ben, say. Um, in dealing with the the business establishments, right? So we have patrons, and you know, I think we need to emphasize a message of social responsibility. When you go out into the public, when you dine in, when you're standing in line at one of our favorite retail stores, uh, each of us needs to assume a level of responsibility for possibly ex getting exposed or exposing ourselves. Um, to COVID-19. And so that's so that's the message that we really want to get across the uh, entire island, that it's out there and we need to do whatever it takes to protect ourselves and our family. And so if we were to publish a list of all the establishments that the cases um, or that these index patients uh, went to, that would be an exhaustive list. It'll be a long list. Right. Um, and, you know, we do a lot um, behind the scenes and we want to reassure um, you guys as well as the general community that we're doing the best we can to make sure that we identify those close contacts and prioritize them for testing and make sure that we prevent uh, the spread of COVID-19. Right, so um, let's just ask with these uh, specific, uh, the surge that we've seen, we had, I mean, we just went over this, how many businesses came out yesterday and said, hey, we've had uh, somebody here test positive what can you tell us about the status of your investigation? Are these cases uh, at these different businesses in any way connected? Is there a cluster? Uh, and right. I know you can't get specific. We get the whole HIPAA thing. So just as much information as you can tell us, even if it's general, we would just appreciate it. All right. So what we know based on our uh, investigation, and this is still our, our investigation is still ongoing. So we know that, um, one of the primary reasons for the uh, increase in social gatherings. Um, and so if you take a look at um, the situational report that goes out as well as the uh, most recent data, there are quite a number of index who are associated with previously diagnosed um, So these are community contacts as well as household contacts. Uh, Vince, you kind of broke up there, but yeah. you, are you, did you say that uh, a majority of these recent positives and and the, we had the business's notification that it's connected to social gatherings correct so we have most of them um that are associated to social gatherings and what are you hearing from these uh people who attended these social gatherings was it just no masks are they large yeah. uh, over 50 type of social gatherings yeah so these are uh gatherings with multiple people. There are instances where we do get reports that people are not wearing masks. And then, you know, I think the problem is, um, is that people are letting their guard down. 
And so again, going back to that uh, emphasis on making sure that we protect ourselves and the people around us needs to go out. People need to wear their masks, practice social distancing, and uh, just stay home if you don't need to go out. Uh, so when, when we had the, all those businesses put out the uh, notices yesterday, what, what I was concerned about is because we had Dr. Akimoto on and he's saying that we don't have enough contact tracers. So in, in my mind, um, what kind of day did you guys have yesterday? And does public health have enough uh, boots on the ground to go to, I mean, God, what was it like nine, 10 businesses that came out yesterday? Mm-hmm. So did we have contact tracers at all these businesses? And do we have enough? Contact Do we need tracers? to hire more? Because we know that the CARES money is there. So let, let me make a clarification. Okay. There's a difference between case investigation, contact investigation, and contact tracers. Contact tracers can just pick up the phone call and do an interview saying you were possibly exposed, you were identified, and you know uh, we're checking on how you're doing and we're recommending you get tested. Case investigators can do both the investigation and contact tracing. So yes, we have enough right now. We scale up as needed. We can pull within our bureau and our department has uh, been proactive where they are within our division itself. We have more uh, public health staff uh, taking the contact tracing course. So with a case investigator, you can have one lead uh, for an index case and uh, the contact tracers, you can have numerous under this one case investigator in case there's a large number of contacts identified. For example, the social gathering instance. There are other cases where the index case, it's just themselves and their household members, which is very small. So a case investigator can handle everything from the investigation to the contact tracing and and be done with that, right? Uh, So it's when these social gatherings, as Vince mentions, people are letting down their guard, people are not wearing their mask at these gatherings. Uh, that's where it, it increases our workload because now we continue to go from the, the gathering site to the household, to the work site, and to any other uh, community, uh, like through friends that we would have to look at. So then we would pull up additional staff to assist with the contact tracing efforts. And so uh, we do have our process in place. We scale up as needed and we scale down as needed. And so again, it all goes back to social responsibility we're seeing an increase because again people are letting down their guard Mm. Um, and it kind of goes back to what Sabrina was asking earlier you know DEH can go in and close a place down yes because those are by their requirements by law that these establishments need to meet even prior to COVID for our side of the house on public health the social distancing measures have been relaxed slowly over the past few months. Public health cannot go in and tell that restaurant, you should not have opened up. Right. You should not have the gathering. So long as they're complying with the required social distancing measures, the cleaning and disinfection requirements that are put in place based on the P core condition, our, our side of the house and public health side, uh, we can only say uh, we have, we've been notified, you possibly have an employee or a patient who, uh, you know, might have exposed other individuals in your establishment. So kind of different. And so that's why it's hard to compare what we're doing with what Division of Environmental Health can do because by law, they are allowed to shut down those establishments if they don't meet the requirements, which were put in place pre-COVID. Right. So so uh, can um, we ask with the businesses that came out and announced they had positive cases, have we seen any other uh, positive cases connected to the ones that the businesses uh, released? case investigation is ongoing and so those individuals we are working with to again we work on the shift schedule uh the date and time of the index case uh, did they go to work or not during their infectious period so that we can determine the list of contacts that we then work with to interview determine their health status and uh, coordinate with getting them tested was it just one social gathering that all these different uh the people these different businesses were at or how many different social gatherings and do we know that the type of of gathering parties dinners uh, are, are what we're hearing, uh, family get togethers. And so it's a wide range. Uh, so any social gathering, again, as Vince mentioned earlier, to so please, it's just individual and uh, uh, responsibility to, to still do the proper safety measures, wearing the mask, frequent hand washing, um, and to not let down our guard. Because it, it again, this disease is, is there's no medication, there's no vaccine to prevent it yet. And really the best measures as everyone has said throughout the different sectors of our community is 
social distancing, hand washing, covering your 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 face with a face covering or a mask, right. uh, staying home if you're sick, yeah. mm-hmm. seeing your doctor if you're starting to feel symptoms. Vince, um, when you when you talk to these people and their I was at a gathering, I was at what's their I mean, are they regretful? What's their their state of mind like when you when you talk to them and you know they're sitting here positive with COVID nineteen, uh, knowing that they could have possibly exposed other people to this deadly virus? Yeah. So you know, a, a lot of them, um, a lot of the individuals that we speak with are very concerned and um, they are regretful, and that's where we remind them, you know, just to continue to um, uh, heed public health's advice. Um, you know, by practicing social distancing. And we also emphasize how important it is um, to be responsible for when you go out. Um, And so definitely, um, you know, whenever they're um, sharing information with us, we also try to relate it to if you were identified um, as a contact, we'd like to make sure that we provide you with the necessary services uh, possible to include testing. Um, And so, you know, it's, um, it's it's a lot of work, I have to say, um, and sometimes our um, investigation and contact tracers uh, staff, we play marriage counsellor, uh, we, we play so many different roles. Wait a minute, that sounds like somebody was with their check man, you guys had like, you, <laughs> you broke know, up any marriages? <laughs> It's really a challenging job. And so, you know, we have to uh, realize too that we're um, getting into uh, intimate details about people's um, lives, you know, and then also their relationships to other people in the community. A lot of people um, that we speak with too uh, feel um, shamed or, uh, you know, mamalao, I guess, um, because they don't want anyone else to know uh, that they were uh, tested positive for COVID. And we reassure them that we're not gonna release any information about them to anyone, including the media. Mm-hmm. This this might be dumb, but how do you guys do your contact tracing in, in like the government quarantine facility? Does it just end with, okay, well, they came from, you know, Hawaii, that's it. No, do you- have- how do you, we would look at the, the, the date of travel, uh, symptom onset, or for those individuals who are asymptomatic, when were they tested, um, and how many days since their arrival. And so there are uh, guidelines with our uh, counterparts at the CDC Honolulu Quarantine Station. Uh, there is a process in place. So depending on the time frame of between the travel dates and the time that they were uh, confirm positive uh there are cutoffs where cdc honolulu does that that uh, does not require us to investigate uh, uh, uh and inform the other passengers who are on the same flight uh if it's too far from the time they flew mm. you know in the past when uh, linda was there she would provide information on um uh contact trace investigations with regard to like clusters that were found. I remember the Iglesio Christie was one of those uh, major clusters. Uh, have you guys, um, do you guys have any um, information on clusters uh, and investigations that, that you've closed or do you, do you guys plan on releasing that sort of information in the future? Or can Again, you? Again, we Again, we are trying to be consistent because of the concern that yes, in the beginning, there was some release of, of identified clusters, uh, which again, um, the media may not have heard of it, but public health had to deal with the backlash and the concerns. And so again, we are trying to balance responsibility to uh, let the public know what they need to know, as well as uh, trying to ensure confidentiality to these individuals. There are some where with such a small island, we're always concerned about information going out that can place a person at this gathering or this event uh, because, oh, so-and-so was there and I know who it was. And then, and unfortunately, then we're dealing with having to put out rumors uh, that are not true. We've seen numerous instances where people were posting, this business had a confirmed case, don't go there. Mm-hmm. It's an employee, don't go there. And so these businesses have to turn around and put out a press release that that was false. And, and it's causing a lot of undue panic uh, in our community, uh, it causes us to take uh, to put a pause on the real work so that we can go put out these rumors. Mm. And we again, we would have to look into that and investigate these rumors. And so again, we're trying to make sure we are doing the the best job, uh, respecting individual at, uh, 
in respecting the the need to provide balanced information while respecting the confidentiality that we are bound by as a public health authority right and it's, it is a, a delicate balance because when we go back and talk about the um, list of businesses that you guys released uh, when the airmen uh, disobeyed their superiors orders and gallivanted all over the island you said everyone was calling you guys right um, but isn't that kind of what you want, though? And then with that instance, we saw a resolution to it in a matter of a few days. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, while I understand that we have to err on the side of caution and we have to balance um, things, I don't know. I'm of the opinion that the more information, mm-hmm. the merrier. Like if you need to put out that, hey, there's a positive here, and then people, they do their own uh, contact tracing. And, they, and if they call you, I'm just thinking like maybe I understand that you guys know how to do your job, but... Um, I feel like people want to help, right? And they yeah. did help when we put out that list of businesses. So I'm just wondering, like, if it worked then? I mean, yeah, people are panicked, but we just need to accept a certain level of panic in a pandemic, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, people are going to panic. I panic every freaking day. Mm-hmm. I work, you know, I mean, I'm panicking right now. And it's just normal. So I'm just wondering, like, we have to accept a certain level of panic um, in order to get the information and a resolution because people want to help you guys, you know, mm-hmm. they do want to help and they, and they want to know where, where, um, where the positives are. Um, and they want to give you information. So I guess if you, you could, because you, you aren't releasing the information and it's not because of HIPAA, you said that you're not releasing it because when you did before it created undue panic. Yeah. So you technically could tell us. Great. Right. But I you mean, don't, you, sometimes you're it not. feels like we're protecting uh, these businesses as opposed to protecting uh, the people. Right. No, it's a balance between information and and uh, not violating HIPAA. Uh, so I think the, the easiest way for me to explain it is COVID is here on Guam. It hasn't gone away. So wherever you go, you should be concerned. Are you possibly being exposed? It ha- We have not declared this pandemic over. There's no medication. There's no vaccine. So it, it shouldn't matter which business we put out there. It could be anywhere on Guam. It's here. It's already here. It hasn't gone away. And so our emphasis is to please practice your own personal responsibility, social responsibility. It's a community wide effort. We're one small island. So it's here. It shouldn't matter whether it was at a family gathering, at a business or or at a was it at the barbecue? Did I go to the beach or was it at the church? The disease is here, unfortunately. Mm. And so to us to start keep him to keep pinpointing these certain businesses, Who's to say it's not at another business, but guess what? They were all asymptomatic because we were not able to test all of our contacts of their previously reported cases. And so that leads me to the next issue of, as we put out all these names of possible places you may have been exposed, then we're getting a big influx, I need to be tested. Mm -hmm. And so now with our limited resources, our, our public health nurses have lost the support because Guam DOE nurses have to be pulled back in preparation for school opening. And so that's limited our ability to do this community-based testing. And unfortunately, our identified contacts were turned away because everyone who wanted, oh, I went to that establishment two weeks ago, or I think I may have been exposed, but I don't know, beat them into the line. And so our poor identified contacts had to wait another day we had to coordinate, okay, they couldn't make it in the line because everyone, uh, uh, there was a large influx to these community-based testing, but then our prioritized identified contacts have to battle to get into that line to make sure they can get swabbed. And so that's the balance I'm talking about. Yes, people want to know, but it's here. It could be in any establishment. So to start pinpointing again where where these businesses or uh, events were, it's going to cause this again influx of people saying i was there oh no my spouse my family member was there so should i get tested even though they weren't there and so that's what we're trying to balance out thank you annette and i appreciate that i mean you guys are not political you guys are on the front line Mm -hmm. doing the damn thing so we definitely appreciate and respect uh but you know we don't know your side of it unless Mm -hmm. we ask so i appreciate Mm -hmm. that you allow us to ask community testing but it it does sound like dr okamoto was right like we need to put more resources over to to your division exactly um to help you guys out and aside from that you just mentioned something and i didn't realize uh that was the reason why we hadn't been seeing um announcements about community testing is because you don't have um the support from uh, the nurses over the guam department of education (laughs) 
So that's kind of um, mind blowing. It's yeah, kind of mind blowing that, that we, we hadn't heard any. You know, we yeah. get all the questions. When's the next community testing? We're like, right, we yeah. haven't heard anything, and now yeah. I know why. And so, Annette, I mean, and and I, I mean, again, it's. Uh, I know this is way above your, you guys' pay status, but, and maybe this needs to be something we kick up all the way to Adaloo. But, I mean, if people are lining up to be community tested, then the government has a responsibility to provide that to these people and we haven't heard about the next community testing people keep calling especially with all these positives so do you guys know when the next community testing is is going to be and do you know if we are trying to shore up the um resources uh, that you guys need whether it's you know i mean can't just hire a bunch of nurses but what are we doing because we got to have community testing we got to we need to so community, the next community testing event has not been scheduled yet because of that issue we're trying to 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 see uh the additional resources that we need our administration has the support of the governor uh, and the lieutenant governor and that they have been pushing to hire additional uh re resources nurses social workers as well as uh additional investigators and contact tracers uh in regards to uh building up our capacity uh our our, administ our administration within the within public health has pushed to have additional contact tracers trained and certified uh within the division of public health but also across the other divisions so as the need uh is there to scale up we can pull across uh within our division but across other divisions as well so we've already had additional 30 contact tracers uh take the, the training. And so if we need them, our, our main investigation team, which Vince leads, it has that uh, resource to pull, uh, you know, to pull up as needed. And so, yes, it's, it's something that we are working with to increase our human workforce uh, to address these issues. Annette, so if we're not having a community testing, uh, just for people out there who want to get tested at public health, uh, what are the options? And again, if you could clarify, if you go to get tested at public health, is there a cost? No, it is free. Uh, there is the availability of going to their primary doctor to request for the testing. The DLS does, cut, does conduct the testing. We are also working with uh, the Physicians Advisory Group and our medical community. Uh, we have been fortunate that HHS FEMA was able to provide us additional Abbott ID Now tests. Uh, testing devices and so that is something that we are working with our uh, pr partners to provide them for point of care testing at their respective clinics uh, and uh, so that is something that to help build up our testing capacity uh, we are also in the process of procuring additional testing equipment for the public health lab uh, so that will increase the amount of testing that can be done uh, and also our administration in the with the support of the governor and lieutenant governor we're pushing to build up our lab staffing uh, resources as well, because that we may have more machines, but we need the additional staff to right. help run those machines. So mm -hmm. which, which uh, public health can people go get tested at, Annette? Uh, currently the testing right now at Northern Public Health is for the identified contacts. Okay. Uh, the When a, a community event based uh, date and time is set, then there will be a press release in regards to that. So nobody because can go to- Because we have to do side visits. So you, uh, we would have to coordinate, sir, I'm sorry, the rescheduling of the two events that were postponed due to inclement weather. Right. And so that is something that our management is looking at and a press release will be uh, released when they have set the date and time and location. So uh, today, nobody can get tested at public any public health facility unless they're an identified um, case. Yes, unfortunately, uh, we know we don't have our central public health, uh, the temporary facility that was being used in Barragata. They have relocated to Dedido. And unfortunately, uh, the Southern Community Health Center in at Inarahan has been temporarily closed due to the uh, HVAC issues. Uh, right. There's no air conditioning. Right. Yes. Uh, Annette, we're heading into a, a weekend. A lot of people work hard this week. They're, uh, you know, uh, I'm pretty sure they're planning gatherings. So I want to give you guys the floor as, as we close. Thank you guys so much for all the time this morning. Um, and thank you for, for answering uh, not really tough questions. We're just coming from a place where people want to know. And I just appreciate the insight that you guys uh, provide. And, uh, you know, also you guys stand in there. So go, so go ahead. What's your message to the people of Guam as we are now seeing a COVID-19 uh, surge and we head into this weekend? Oh, wait, before you, before that, um, the surge in cases, <laughs> can you say whether or not they were coming from Hawaii? Originating from Hawaii? 
we have from quarantine, but they're not, no, not from Hawaii. They're from the continental U.S. Okay. okay. Can you say We're where? getting it from everywhere in quarantine, from unfortunately. Okay. So, but, but thankfully, the, the process, even though not everyone agrees with us quarantining inbound passengers, it is showing that it is working because we have identified additional cases prior to them uh, going out into the, the regular community. So right. if we didn't have this quarantine of inbound passengers, we, Vince and his team would actually have more cases to deal with and contact tracing to uh, conduct because these individuals were fortunately still in the quarantine facility tested. They, they became positive and they were moved, relocated to the isolation right. facility. I, mm -hmm. I, I know we had the Tricky Association of Guam on uh, yesterday and they had said that there was a, a, a traveler who had come from Hawaii and was granted an exception to attend a, a funeral. And then um, I wasn't really clear on what uh, he had said after that, but there was an exposure. And uh, so, again, with you guys and these exceptions, and we asked Dr. Hoa this, do you guys have issues with the, some of these exceptions that are being granted? For quarantine, is there a, is there a it's risk? A balance. There are those there are those who are coming in that designated essential worker, and then of course uh, for hardship and for unfortunate medical or for funeral. And so of course uh, we have to be compassionate to those issues. And again, it doesn't uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it would be for anyone, regardless of ethnicity, race, uh, political status, or. Uh, you know the your uh, social economic situation if there is a hardship medical uh, there's a medical need emergency or for a funeral those are the things that our director uh takes into place to allow for uh self-quarantine and restriction of movement mm -hmm. uh, so we had just one last question and then we'll let you guys uh close uh, can uh, somebody who's not a nurse be trained to do that COVID 19 swab or is that something that only nurses and medical uh, people can do Currently, it's our nurses. Uh, there is a lot of talk and there's been um, releases in the states about self-swabbing. Mm. Uh, and so it's going to be on the individual. But that test is not currently available here through public health. I wouldn't trust uh, that anyway. Our, yeah, because you're, now you're going to have to do it yourself. And how uh, how far how deep are how you How far really up going? are you going to go? Because I, I got swabbed, man. And it was like, I didn't know I had that much nostril. I didn't know it went up that far. <laughs> Yes, it's, it's not a pleasant experience. Yeah. So again, it's uh, right now our public health nurses, the DOE nurses uh, and new uh, hires are the ones or volunteer nurses are the ones who are responsible for the swabbing. All right. And then uh, we, had, we had talked to Dr. Ho yesterday. He's saying that he wants to tell the physician's advisory group to lower the limit on gatherings, which is currently at, at 50. Is this something that, that you guys as, as boots on the ground? Is this something that you guys think would, would help? Definitely. I think it would definitely help uh, if we minimize that. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to, uh, I'm looking at the uh, public health's website and the, and the dashboard. And um, I'm specifically with eth ethnicities, um, it shows like other, um, what was 200, is that 200%? What can you tell us, like just break down where are you seeing an increase in COVID cases? Uh, with regard to ethnicities? Because all this says is other. I don't know what other other means. It says so Filipino. Other they may not, yeah, for other, they may indicate uh, that they're yeah. European, mm -hmm. that they're just Micronesian or Pacific mm -hmm. Islander. They didn't specify where yeah. they're from. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, it's, it's the Chamorros and Filipinos have the higher uh, percentage and I... to be expected. Mm -hmm. Those are the two largest populations on Guam. Right. Mm -hmm. But have you seen an increase in um, uh, confirmed cases with, with the Chukis community? I mean, because the, the cause came out yesterday and it sounded like he was really concerned. Right. So I'm wondering if you guys are seeing an increase and you can verify that. I, there, I cannot verify that. Uh, I w cannot confirm or deny that uh, no. because, again, we are very careful in how we say, well, which ethnic, ethnic group has a higher percentage. This but you can say Filipino. I mean, it says here Filipino. And, and so I don't understand why so you can't say Chukis or you can't say Palawan. You can't. It wouldn't it wouldn't be a proper representation because there are numerous individuals who just wrote 
Micronesia. Right, yeah. and, they, and these people are self-declaring. They're not specifying, they're, they're not specifying which state. There are four states, so I mm-hmm. can't say, okay. oh, yes, they were all two kids when they right, only right. say Micronesia. Was there, okay, so was there any increase in Micronesian? S- a slight when they're under the other. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so now can we get you guys to do a, a closing because I think it's important. People, uh, these are the folks who are investigating because you guys cannot keep still out there. Now they have to work through this weekend to help stop the spread of COVID. Uh, so, uh, guys, what, what's your message to the, the people of Guam? So, wear your mask, practice social distancing, and continue to practice social responsibility. Do your part to uh, protect yourself and your loved ones. Annette, I know you got a big close in there. <laughs> no, uh, Vince hit it right on the spot. Again, we are not out of the woods. COVID, unfortunately, is still here. Uh, and so please, as Vince mentioned, it's a social and individual responsibility. It's it's a community-wide effort, private, public, the media, uh, the military. We can't do this alone, and we need your assistance and your support. And so we do thank all of our, our partners throughout the, the island that continue to assist us to get the information out like you all are doing with KOM. Um, and for those who uh, are reporting to us that they're concerned that, you know, that so-and-so is having a big party or, you know, they're not wearing their mask. And we, we do appreciate that. But again, uh, public health is here to do their job responsibility and to the best of our ability. And, uh, you know, we, we thank you for that, but def- definitely wear your mask, cover your cough and wash your hands frequently and right. as much as possible, social distancing um, uh, measures uh, to, to comply with. Thank right. you. Thank you. And thank you so much, Vince. Appreciate you guys. Thank yeah, you. definitely. God bless you guys. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. I'm busy. I know they're going to be working. Um, <laughs> well, thank you to the uh, public health. Uh, and, you know, I got to com- uh, commend the director, Art uh, St. Augustine, the new director of uh, public health. I I called him yesterday because, um, you know, they're so uh, busy and just going through the regular channels. Sometimes we can't get people for a couple days, which is totally understandable. But I just felt like with this surge, man, I, I called him. I was like, man, uh, Mr. St. Augustine, people want to hear from public health. So mm-hmm. thank you so much uh, for. Thanks, Art. Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's 802, um, Sabrina, or KUAM FM in Hagatnia, Guam. We'll take a short break. And thank you for watching on our KUAM uh, TV 11 uh, stream. Guys, if you want to jump over, if you like what you see here, hey, all right. <laughs> uh, check out the KUAM News uh, Facebook <laughs> live feed. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> That's Edward R. Murrow award-winning oh. stuff right there. I <laughs> uh, remember we're also streaming at KUM.com, the KUM uh, news app. Again, it is the link on the breeze, 93.9, proudly brought to you by Polka, it and and Kalo Enterprises. Good morning, Guam! CBS Primetime tonight. GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. We got your six. At 6 a.m. with the link on Breeze 93.9 FM. Bree and I connect you with all the latest news and information you need to know to start your day. Then check back with Guam's news leader at 6 p.m. for the day's top headlines with KUAM News Primetime. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and everything else in between with KUAM Digital, we got your six.
Prepare la noche, nai panderata gaigi, pues atan fani bandera ko esta pogwa puma la la pa kilo tanu man libri sentami ti man ko badi
got your six. At 6 a.m. with The Link on Breeze 93.9 FM. Bree and I connect you with all the latest news and information you comments? need to know to start your day. Then check back with Guam's news leader at 6 p.m. for the day's top headlines with KUAM News Prime Time. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and everything else in between with KUAM Digital, we got your six. Times people have said, Man, we miss you yelling Friday. Friday, whoa, be my fitness. Good morning, 8 13. It's the link on the breeze 93 9. Proudly brought to you by Polka, where they have the peach tea, it's totally peachy. The lemon tea, uh, they've got the cappuccino, and it's all uh, Sabrina approved. Oh my goodness. Uh, also brought to you by <laughs> IT and uh, Calvo uh, Enterprises, where um, our breakfast this morning. Uh, can we show these guys that again, sir? Are we able? Oh, okay. Come on, Bree. Bree the Baker. Um, describe it if, if you could, Bree. It's a uh, strawberry guava cupcake. There's a. Uh, can you sound a little excited <laughs> about it? Jeez. Be proud of your Green cheese. A uh, frosting with some guava gel on top. The big reveal. Yeah. There you go. Look at that. Uh, it's funny, for those of you, in case you missed it, Jason Solis thought those were salmon cupcakes <laughs> <laughs> with like a cream cheese dill. I should have told him, uh, yeah, it's salmon. <laughs> no, hey, no, you know what? <laughs> yeah, okay. Brian. <laughs> no, you know what? I mean, if we have salted caramel... Yeah, salted is, caramel which, which and my, salmon cream cheese cupcakes. That's, yeah. a, that's a way different. No, which in my opinion, salted caramel, I mean, that is a, a contradiction in terms. Yeah, it's salted. It's not salty. Yeah. Uh, 814, good morning. 637-0094, uh, that's our number. Uh, we're going to do a quick uh, link news update, and then uh, we're going to go into quarantine. Don't worry, we'll be able to get back out again, but the people we're going to talk to are kind of stuck for the moment and we'll, we'll catch up uh, with them and then we've got the office of finance and budget director steve guerrero and the legislative budget chair senator joseph augustine on the way uh, but first again a link update from the kuam news team tomas manglotnia Good morning, everyone. I'm Tomas Manglonia with your headlines on here on The Link. The island's total number of COVID-19 positive cases since mid-March is now at 397. According to the latest report out of the Joint Information Center, there are eight new cases of COVID-19 out of the 442 test samples. Of the new cases, six cases were from Public Health Lab and two from DLS. 
These cases are under investigation of the new cases. One case had recent travel to the continental U.S. Two cases were identified through contact tracing and three cases were identified through community screening. To date, there have been five deaths, 321 released from isolation, three hospitalized and 71 active cases. Let the government budget debate begin. Lawmakers will meet in session next week to pass a spending plan for fiscal year 2021. On Wednesday, Finance Chairman Senator Joe San Augustine finally released a revenue projection that he says the administration agrees with, but at least one senator believes they'll need a lot more information. $983 million is what Senator San Augustine and the legislature's Office of Finance and Budget say is the amount of revenue the government will collect for FY21, just 8% less than the pre-pandemic projection for the current fiscal year. Just but speaking on KUAM's The Link Multimedia said. Show, Sorry, Senator Therese Terlahi, who's been pressing San Augustine to release the numbers, says only that it's a good start. I want to commend OFB that they've actually... Uh, got the administration to to get off that you know there will be no adjustments to the budget at all right down to right. A, a very significant change to now we are looking at a reduced revenue amount and we are going to work hard to make that work i want to make sure we are going to take care of critical services and we know what we have to do to take care of those critical services. But Terlahi says the administration needs to be more transparent about its spending. She'd like to know more about federal CARES Act expenditures and previous appropriations that were never spent, like $10 million for hospital improvements. The numbers are in, but the reports are not. They're not due till August 20. By that time, we're, you know, um, almost at the end of our budget, right. you know, uh, deadline. And so that's why I'm asking for that information up front. How do you expect us to do a budget with this kind of information? And we should know what type of deficit did they actually pay down, like they said they would with the 2019 excess revenues. Are there any other excess revenues that they haven't spent? Because that would be very significant for us right now, don't you think? Session is scheduled for 10 a.m. Monday. The legislature is required by law to pass a budget by the end of this month. 23 years ago on this day, the tragic Korean Air Flight 801 crash occurred in Nimitz Hill. 229 lives, 229 lives were lost, and today those souls are remembered. A memorial ceremony was held at the monument located in the remote area. Family, friends, loved ones, and Guam lawmakers joined the Korean Association to commemorate the 23rd anniversary. Ina Lee with the Korean community shared her story. As Lee was working for the airline at the time and had lost her brother, who was on board that flight on August 6, 1997. It was really hard for me to live a life that uh, brother left while, while I'm working with Korean Air, but uh, God is giving us that he's in heaven with no pain mm -hmm. and resting in peace, so we got faith that we can live without it, but uh, every moment, every year anniversary is painfulness to uh, feel his soul, and he was my closest brother. <laughs> Lee says 185 bodies were never recovered, including her brothers. The monument is located in a military restricted area, which only allows visitors to come pay their respects on this one day a year. Lee says the pandemic was not going to stop her from visiting her brother. That's the news for now. We'll see you all tonight at 6, at six on Primetime. 20, um, let's go ahead and go to our Zoom room. Um, where uh, we have uh, standing by uh, David uh, Espinosa and his daughter Donna Espinosa. Um, they are a father and daughter currently in quarantine. And um, they, they reached out to us. They sent some uh, messages. Uh, they're having some uh, really, really terrible issues uh, with, with the quarantine. Um, and we wanted to bring them on and really air it out because um, I feel like they're, they're not, uh, from what they're saying, they're not being given the time of day. And, you know, a lot of times big government just tries to trample on the little people. And we want to give the little people a voice. So let's uh, go right to our Zoom room. Good morning, sir. Uh, good morning. Good morning. How are you? We're, uh, we're doing good, Mr. Espinosa. And your daughter Donna, is she there too? Uh, yes, I'm here. Okay, Donna, can um, do we need to turn the phone sideways, Jay? Or no, she's good. She's good. Okay, let's just start at the beginning. So, when did you guys arrive on uh, Guam, and uh, when did you go into quarantine, and what kind okay. of problems have you had since then? Okay, uh, we arrived in on Guam August fifth, 
Yes, in the evening. And we did not know that we were going to be quarantined. Well, yeah, did... we thought we were going to be, you know, going home when we arrived to Guam, but we didn't. When we got to the airport, they told us we can't go home. We're going to end up going to Ocean View Hotel and be quarantined there for 14, 14, 14 days. days. Right. Where did you guys arrive from? We arrived from um, Honolulu. Right. So, Donna, when you say you didn't know that you were going to be quarantined, did you just not know that you needed a, a COVID-19 test? Or did you think that your father, because of his medical condition, was going to be allowed to, to go home and home quarantine? No, we actually, my, my father and I did not know that we we're going to be quarantined at home. The Guam VA did not tell us anything. When we were in Hawaii, no one, you know, no one told us anything about being quarantined here at Ocean View Hotel. We... It was just a surprise when we came to the airport. Mm -hmm. uh, so so did, you weren't even aware that, that there's a mandatory quarantine in place when you, you arrived to Guam? No, we weren't aware. We, we, no one told us anything. How long have we you been? We thought we were going to go home, you know? How long have you been off island? We've been off island for about like two days because my dad has a, you know, a medical condition. Right. And every other month, we always go to Honolulu because he can have a checkup with his doctor there. And so when was the last time your father went to uh, Honolulu for a checkup? Uh, Mar last March. And that was before the quarantine uh, was in effect? Yes. Yes. Okay. And what, what are you able to tell us what type of medical condition um, your father has? He has an open heart, di diabetic. Um, everything. Uh, everything. Yeah. So take us right. take us through. You arrived on August fifth. You went up to Ocean View. Right. And, and take what happened after that. Hello. Yes, Donna. Hello. Do, sir, sir. So when you guys landed at the the airport, it, can you tell us? Did you tell the public health people there that your father is, uh, you know, coming from an appointment, suffering from different um, ailments, and what was their uh, response to you guys? I'm not gonna hear what you said. Sir? Okay, can you repeat that again? I couldn't hear you. Oh, uh, when when you came into uh, Guam at the airport and you were uh, you know getting off the plane and dealing with the public health people, did you tell them that your father has, uh, has suffered from you know numerous medical conditions? And what was the response uh, when you did? Yes, we, I have told them about my dad's condition, and my father also told them. And they act the national guard at the airport. They even wrote you know wrote all my dad's uh, condition down. They were asking, you know, everything, what he can eat, what he can't eat, you know. And I even asked him, if we get to the, the hotel, will he be served, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner? And they told me yes. But that, the, when we got to the hotel, it was already like 11, I, I believe 11 o'clock. And I asked him if he can still be served, you know, dinner because he hasn't taken his medication. And he hasn't eaten his, you know, dinner in the plane because they don't serve food in the plane. And my dad had to wait 1 a.m. When we got to the hotel, we waited so long, almost like 2 o'clock in the morning. And I keep asking the front desk, you know, for assistance, and they keep transferring me to the National Guard. National Guard told me, okay, we'll be there, and then they will, you know, deliver my dad's dinner. But instead of dinner, they end up delivering snacks like hot Cheetos, uh, right? Candy. And that's crackers. not good for your diabetes. And that's right. not good for him, you know, to be eating while he's taking his medication. Right. And, and, and I was told that they would, you know, they would give us like rice and meat and you know vegetables. Donna, um, was there? There's also an issue. So your father takes uh, his medication in the morning, and he needs to take that medication by a certain time and he needs to take it with a meal and so your message to us was that he's not getting the meals on time to take his medication right right They're, we're not getting the meals in time they say 8 30 you know breakfast will come Look, they're probably calling you to any breakfast yet. right and so you haven't gotten breakfast yet it's 8 30. right and that's the time he takes his medication 
what I don't understand is I don't understand why your father wasn't given an exception to go home and mm-hmm. home quarantine. I mean, he's obviously got some medical um, ailments. What what is and have you told that to the the people there at the uh, quarantine facility, Donna? That you know, hey, my dad is ill. Can we go home quarantine? Or are you just understanding right. and trying to get the all the help that you can get while you're there? Right. Yes, I did ask that when we first arrived, but. The National Guard said, no, you cannot go home. You have to be quarantined like everybody else. Did you, you know, regardless if you're, if you're sick or not. And my father did get um, tested COVID-19 at Tripler in Hawaii. And then, you know, he has to get it tested again here in Guam. That's what they told you? They- yes. And it was a negative test? Uh, we didn't get the results yet. From and- Tripler? From Tripler, we did not get the results yet. And yesterday, we just got tested. And the lady from public health told me that they will be calling me to you know let us know about our results. That way, we can be quarantining at home. How hard has it been for your father uh, living in these um, conditions, Donna, especially having just come from open heart surgery? Yes, actually, he wants to go ahead and talk because, yes. yeah, he's even frustrated, too, with the National Guard, sir. As a veteran, we'll, yeah, we'll give you the floor, Mr. Espinosa. I'm going to say. Say anything. Go ahead, go ahead, oh. sir. Yeah. Just don't uh, cuss, don't cuss, huh? But Jason, this is Dave. Um, I was surprised here in Guam. I know everything is under roof, but the problem is I got them. Um, I got a health problem. I have to eat the way the medication want me to eat. But they gave me candy and, and cake. I cannot eat that too sweet. That's bad for my diabetic. So they don't care. So that's why I cannot control myself because I think right now is I'm, I'm under God protection now. That's why I'm still alive. That's why we want to talk to you so you can bring bring this out to the people of Guam. This has got to be stopped for another patient. That's all I can say to you, Jason, because I cannot control already what I'm going to say to you. So I want you to take everything possible to tell the director of public health everybody got sickness they have to control but the guard here they're scared they don't want to die in virus everybody got to die in the world depend what god wants you if god wants you no matter whether you got virus or what he's going to take you that's my daughter, Donna. Nice shirt. Uh, Donna, we, we've yes. got a, someone from um, the National Guard uh, spokesperson has just uh, messaged us that uh, they are they are going to be uh, reaching out to you guys. Um, but, man, I'm just <clears throat> fr- pissed. You, this ha- is ridiculous. Yeah. Ha- have you guys seen the public health nurse? Have you guys talked with them? To no, see. not exactly in person. Um, maybe on the phone, but whenever they call me, it's like they always ask the same questions. You know, um, what kind of pills is your father taking? The, the same thing every morning. And, you know, and I always tell them that that's not what I want to hear. You know, I want to, you know, because I'm concerned about my father. Donna, Donna, I know you, you were telling me that your dad, obviously with his medical condition, there's some special diet right that he's got to get and so you were telling me last night that you had reached out to your family members to drop food off and that you were told that that was okay but then what happened right. when, when your relatives dropped the, the food and then the other things for you and your father yeah i have my brother and um my son to drop off some food and my dad's insulin and then when they came here they waited 30 minutes and when they left i know i was like wondering um you know, why are they taking on? Because, you know, my dad needs to eat and he needs to take his medication. So I called the front desk and the front desk transferred me to the National Guards. You know, when I called the National Guard, 
they they said yes that you know my brother dropped off um you know food and my dad's insulin medicine and so from there um i asked if i they could drop it over to our you know they can't drop off the the medicine the clothes and the food with that you know we asked for to deliver and i asked them why because you know even the nationals when i asked them can i can we you know ask our family to bring some clothes and food and my dad's medicine and they say yes yeah, you can so from there we were refused when i asked you know, if I, if I could have the stuff that my family brought over for us. And they said, you know, they, they cannot give us it until the next day. And so my father was very disappointed because he needs his insulin. Your father's and, you know, a... we, food that we haven't been eating because either they deliver the food, you know, to us so late, it's, it's terrible. Donna, your father's a veteran, right? Yes, he's a veteran. He's a retired army. Have you have you had heard anything from the local veterans affairs or the uh, VA uh, in Hawaii or anything? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. Well, we have we've got another message from uh, the Guam National Guard. Uh, the PIO Mark Scott uh, text in. This is unacceptable, and I will dedicate all of my time to finding out why things happen this way and ensure that it gets fixed. And Donna, I just like I said, I'm very pissed that you got to call the media to get involved. And I mean, your your right. father's elderly, looking at him, not to see a day, you know, and that that to find out that they're not giving you the time of day, right? And telling exactly. you one I thing, did. and then it turns out to be something else. And the fact that you know you your dad has medical conditions and he's stuck there in uh, quarantine. I it it is. You're right. It, <laughs> I'm pissed. <laughs> right, exactly. It is just terrible. I mean, it's we understand terrible. that, you know, everybody has to be on quarantine when they come on Guam, but when you make exceptions for certain uh, individuals, and this is one that you can see definitely needs uh, <laughs> an exception. Right. Right. I mean, they they gave exceptions to for the weirdest reasons. They, they're giving exceptions to people who aren't even sick, who have like mm -hmm. an in law that's sick. Mm -hmm. I and, mean, they're right. and they're locking your your father up. And then there's this investigation we heard earlier this week about a, a 40 year old man that passed away, and well, he they right. said, oh, he doesn't have COVID, but he may have had underlying health conditions. Right, and here we have right. a, a, yeah. your father with the underlying health conditions. How many more people are going to die in these facilities? Exactly, and I'm not going to stand by and you know, watch my father die. It's just terrible because, you know, if the National Guards are going to be, you know, in charge, then they need to act like they're in charge. You know, they cannot be scared because my dad's having a heart attack and they cannot come inside the room because they're scared to get the virus. I mean, then what's the use of being in charge? What's the use of being a guard outside? I mean, who's going to come in and help my father? It's terrible. It is, and it's terrible when you hear things about people with political connections to this administration being able to walk right out of the airport, no problem, and then we get people like you who don't know anybody. Right, and they exactly. lock you up and throw away the key. Right. So yes. the first day when we've been quarantined, my dad needed an assistant. And, you know, my, my father called in one of the, the National Guards and he never came in. He was like, no, I can't. I was like, why? I was standing next to him. I was like, why can't you? Because he's scared to get the virus. And I was like, then who I'm going to call? I mean, if I call the ambulance, I'm sure the ambulance won't come in because he might get the virus. If he can't come in, then you can't come in. I mean, so what's the difference, you know? Somebody has to come in and check my father. Where's the nurse? There's no nurses down here. That none, Not even one nurse came to our room well, to check on my father. We don't even have father. enough nurses to do community testing. Right. Donna, we are put it out. The people know. I hope uh, the governor saw your father's T-shirt. 
Can we get that okay, T-shirt again? Yeah. Let's go. Hey, Lou and Josh, we have one of your people locked up in quarantine. Not Missy a day. Uh, he's a veteran. Uh, your shirt, they like your shirt. Uh, Maybe that's what we got to do is show the shirt for him to get out. Okay. Because it seems like that's what it takes. Donna, we thank you so much. I apologize on behalf of uh, the National Guard. I apologize on behalf of the Department of Public Health. I apologize on behalf of this administration that your your father and you are being treated in this way. It's totally unacceptable. Right. Well, I'm glad I talked to you guys. Because, oh, me too. You know, I even called the governor, but they told me that she was in the meeting and she never returned my call. And I even wrote to um, Mike and Nicholas, but I haven't got any replies from him. <laughs> it's just, you know, from Jason Stollis and Chris Parkman and Sabrina, you guys. We're here for you, yeah. Don. Mr. Espinosa, you God much. bless you. And, and I have a feeling something's going to happen for you guys today. Yeah. And you let us know if it doesn't. Oh, yes, I will. Thank you, Donna. Take care. God bless you, Mr. Espinosa. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you for your service. And Back to Justin. Okay. Bye, <laughs> okay. <Mr. Espinosa. laughs> All right. <laughs> For anybody else that's watching out there, if you know somebody that's in quarantine or if you are in quarantine, please give us a call. Uh, let us know what you're going through. Uh, 637-0094. And you can also just reach out to us on Facebook. All right. Um, let's uh, move on to our Zoom room now. Switch uh, gears uh, here at 837. Uh, I know we have a, a few minutes for the uh, Legislative Budget Chair and the Office of Finance and Budget uh, Director, Senator Joe San Augustine, and uh, Steve Guerrero. Uh, good morning. First, hey, good morning, Bruce. First, morning. Senator Joe, when you hear um, from people like Mr. Espinoza, I mean, what is your reaction to that? Because we did have Dr. Akimoto on earlier, and he was calling out the legislature and this budget um, and the fact that we're not seeing um, enough funding for our public health officials. And we just heard from public health earlier about how they don't even have enough nurses to conduct con community testing because GDOE's nurses have to go back to school. And we've been hearing all kinds okay, of crazy um, stuff about quarantine. Yeah. So, 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 what is the question? Because uh, my, our understanding is that uh, the governor's office has CARES money. They have funding for public health. There's funding for GMH. Are, are, are you saying, or um, Dr. Uh, Akimoto is saying that there's no money there? They're not hiring anybody? Uh, or are they asking that, is there any way to convince DOE to delay the starting of the school year so we can maintain some participation by DOE nurses? What, what, what is the, what is the, Bottom line question. Okay, all right. Then what is your reaction to uh, what Mr. Espinosa was saying? Let's just oh, start no, I, there. Well, I know Mr. Espinosa. I know him personally. Uh, I met him on several occasions. I've known him for many years. Um, what he was saying was, uh, the only part I caught was that, uh, you know, he arrived. They didn't even have his meals ready. Um, they didn't give it to him. They didn't give him crackers. Uh, crackers. Uh, you know, they, they, the folks that are supporting, the folks that are, in quarantine, they need to be very uh, mindful of what's going on and who's being quarantined and at what time they're being quarantined. They need to set up a program. I'm just surprised that um, with all these the issues he's brought up that I call the tail end is that it should never have happened. It should be there should have been a means to get food to everyone quarantined. If you if if the quarantine uh, station already identified, they provide breakfast, lunch, and dinner. There are restaurants out there. Go get the meal. You already committed to it. Go get the meal. Give it to the gentleman. Give it to the to the, to the ladies or whoever, and provide them what they need. Uh, Mr. Espinosa, he, he he needs to take his medication. That should be a no-brainer. And and if and if public health is not there or GMA's folks not there, you we can't be blaming soldiers now. Soldiers are not doctors. Um, the folks that need to be on site should be the proper folks. Uh, soldiers are there to service guard. And, and ensure the security and safety of everybody. But they're, you know, they're not the right folks that, that need to participate to Mr. Espinosa's needs. Yeah, the, and, the and reason, that should have been an easy one. Yeah, and the reason is because public health has a shortage of, of nurses and personnel to even do community testing. And obviously, if, if these guys are talking to the guard, maybe public health, I don't even know, do they even have anybody there? 
We don't well, know. Well, you remember, Chris, that in the beginning of this quarantine, they had a bunch of folks there monitoring and uh, high paid folks monitoring. What happened? <laughs> All of a sudden, now, what did they run out of money? What's the next excuse? You know, there's a requirement. You have the proper pl- people at the proper place to do the, to take the appropriate action. Uh, the other folks there, the National Guard people, they're not there as doctors. Now, if they're going to be there for that purpose, then make sure that the right, they're the right soldiers with the right field. Right. You know the right uh, skill that they have because I know that the soldiers, if, if you if you assign them to to guard duty, they'll do it. If you assign them to medical duty, then they better be medical folks. Right. And, and that's just how it works. And that's how the military moves. Uh, Senator, we'll just jump right into the uh, budget discussion uh, because I know you're you're limited on time. But can you explain uh, specifically how you came up with the revenue projection of nine hundred eighty three? Uh, million dollars. Now we know that's about eight percent less than um, last fiscal year in the middle of this pandemic. So I, I guess uh, the question: Do you think that federal assistance is really going to make up for the drastic plunge in tourism? And if you could explain how you came up with that formula. Okay. Okay. Well, when it starts out, when you ask about the nine hundred million, we start out with first um, the general fund. We're looking at is seven hundred and seventy-five, and then we're looking at about two hundred. Uh, Plus million, four hundred eight million for the special funds. So when you put together, it comes up to nine, right? Um, but what we're looking at appropriating is only seven hundred million um, to the agencies. And when we identify the special funds, by law, they're dedicated, they're specific to agencies for a specific purpose. And we're trying to get that lined up the way it should have been lined up for many, many years. And and you know, and 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 that's and that's one of the uh, um, gosh, that's one of the hardest thing to do, but we're, we're doing our best to try to get everything to start getting lined up. And, you know, it's going to take a while because, you know, you got to change the, I would say the bad habits of, of the past and fix it so that it'll be right. And then we can move forward. And then, uh, you know, there are a lot of special funds out there that don't mean anything. They're actually flattened out. There's no money going into that. And then, um, what was your next question, Chris? Well, I wanted to ask, so you have the, the, Revenue projection, right? The seven hundred seventy-five million, right? That's what you said. That's correct. Okay, and so what about um, the how that's going to break down to each particular agency? I think Senator Teresa Lahi she had written a letter uh, earlier this week about how they hadn't received adjusted revenues or or agency appropriations. Do you guys have that as you head into session? Well, well, you know, Chris and Sabina. I, I gotta, I gotta let you know that number one, every senator in the 35th Guam legislature was called into the Office of Finance and Budget and was sat down individually and given a briefing of exactly where we stand, where we got the 775, and every senator that had no oversight of an agency was briefed specifically. If I'm correct, Steve, and Steve's right next to me. Um, his folks sat down and briefed them about what is projected that their agency will get or could receive. And and and, and that was for, and then for the, the senators that are not overseeing any agencies, they were given a general uh, briefing. And if they had any specific questions, they were given specific answers. Mm-hmm. So for any senator to say, well, I don't know what my agency is getting wrong, 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 wrong. You were given a briefing. Now to, 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 to claim otherwise, uh, I have four or five folks that sits sits down during the briefing and we open it all up and we say, this is what we're looking at, this is what we're projecting based on historical data, based on what's been happening in the past and, and coming up with a, a uh, more uh, conservative approach to the budget because if it doesn't go positive, at least we were very conservative and if it doesn't get any better today, we're going to have to go lower. Why, why didn't and you do the that, up, it. Senator? If things don't change, it's not going to get any better. Why meet individually behind closed doors? Why not do it in committee no, of the whole? No, it's, it's, well, it's you know, just for transparency's uh, sake. You want to call it a closed door, but uh, they were all called in so that they all understand what's coming down uh, by Monday. Is that a private mm-hmm. meeting or is that a public meeting? Well, I'm, I'm not going to claim it to be a public because I didn't do a five day notice, but. Uh, mm-hmm. Um, if, uh, any of the senators that walked in were briefed the same thing. It just seems like there's a veil of secrecy uh, behind this whole process that's a little unnerving. No. 
what, what was the difference? I'm sorry. What was the difference between uh, the administration's uh, uh, revenue projections from January uh, to to what you came up with uh, recently? What was the, the difference in numbers? Yeah, their 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 initial request was um, you know over a billion dollars. Um, since then, we've been working with the administration to try to refine and, and finite this number based on current information that we receive on a daily basis. So based on the CERs that we're coming in over the last five, six months, it gives us kind of like a, uh, uh, an overview of what's been happening recently, which has never happened before in such a short period of time. So from the revenue base, they, they predicted, I mean, they, they projected uh, they brought it down. We've actually brought it down for about about 106 million. So it's no longer a one billion dollar request. It's below that. Right right now, it's roughly running about 951 million. So there, there's been an adjustment in it. Um, so far, we've agreed to 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 this level. Uh, you now there may be some adjustments uh, even by the end of the day. It just depends. But by the end of the day, we will have a fixed number to put a bill together for for FY21 budget year. Are you guys uh, getting input from the administration uh, on that bill? Or are they going to give you we a bill? We have been working with the, with the administration on a daily basis to try to get some input from them, their information. So the answer is yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what about uh, uh, cuts? What kind of cuts can you say right now that we're looking at? What I can tell you right now, Spina, is that based on your current, based on the current FY 2020 appropriation level, every department has received a cut. The percentage of the cut varies simply because the type of operation each department um, uh, utilizes is, is different in terms of funding requests. You got some agencies that are funded or the personal requirements are anywhere from 50 to 70%. Then you got some agencies that funding requirements for personnel go as high as 85, 90%. So of course, you know, the, the funding requirements for these agencies will vary and so with the percentage decrease or any cuts allotted to them. You said 85% cuts to specific agencies or certain agencies? No, no, no. I've been saying 85% of their budget, uh, an agency's budget. Mm -hmm can represent personnel costs alone. Mm -hmm. So you're basically saying so there's nowhere to cut unless we cut people. On some of these on some of these agencies, Chris, it's going to be very tough to cut. And if we do cut, uh, say, say we did it across the board, mm -hmm. equal cut, some of these agencies wouldn't have sufficient funds to cover the warm bodies on board right now. Are you cutting public health? Uh, Every every department has been has been issued a decrease in their appropriation. Yes. Cutting GMA. It's, it's difficult. Yes, Sabrina. It's it's difficult to maintain a at even a status quo level when we're cutting the budget almost by sixty eight million dollars. Mm -hmm. And there's just no way of cutting out um, agencies that you know aren't a priority right now. Well. Again, you know, Sabrina, mm. that that is really not the legislature's right, um, right. Yeah, yeah, Steve. So when you guys go to Adelu for your secret budget meetings, you don't ever say, "Hey, uh, Adelu, why don't we just agree to maybe cut these deputy directors, maybe rescind the hiring of the CA director, a hundred thousand? You know, I mean, are they offering any type of? you know, savings ideas? Because I know what you guys are going to say. If we well, talk well, about the deputy directors, again, it's going to be, oh, we're infringing on the executive branch, but that doesn't stop the executive branch from doing it on their own and saying, hey, yeah, we know we have the authority to hire these deputies, but we want to save money, so we're not going to, or we're going to vacate the positions well, and, you know. Well, Chris, uh, Chris and Sabrina, you, we have to remember that since March, I've been asking for a realignment. I've been asking for a revised budget. Up to this day, I'm still asking. Can we see some form of realignment? Remember that part of the organic act, that's the responsibility of the executive branch. Um, if it was a responsibility, let's say, to, to just start slashing and realigning, this would have been done already. But because it's it's not within our authority, uh, all we're doing, all I'm, I keep doing is promoting realignment. Uh, and, and you're right, that there may be some agencies that, um, like Sabrina brought up, 
maybe they don't really need to be there. Maybe they need to be consolidated. Maybe we need to take a look at uh, when we do some realignment, um, merging agencies so that they have the biggest impact and the best results. And, and, and that's something that I've, I've reached out to all my colleagues, all 15 or 14, and asked them, uh, we need to do something. And, and, and we need to um, find a way to convince downtown that we need to sit down. We need to take a look at a realignment of this government. Yeah, but Can't you have been fun. sitting down with them. We, I mean, you, you guys just said we've yeah, been meeting we've been with them. So, I mean, is that it? Like, okay, no, I don't got no plan. All right, that's it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> you you can say that you're you're working with them, and and yet they're, you're not getting anything. So, is yeah. that that's it? I mean, you've been meeting with them. How many meetings no, you had? We're, we're still we're still we're still pushing it. Okay. There's nothing else that can be done. Just. I just don't know why Adloop doesn't come out and say, hey, here's where we want to cut, and that's that. And, you know, sorry, deputies, or whatever. Tough times. Yeah, Chris, what, what, what we're doing right now, um, you know, we're doing the best we can to allocate whatever resources the government has available and or projects to get within the next 12 months or in, in, in this year, 2021. And we, refer, we, we try to appropriate the basic needs, uh, personnel, contractual obligations, utilities, and rent. Those are kind of like the finite uh, um, items we, we want to we want to budget for. Anything other than that, we really have been really uh, reducing those levels uh, even to the point that, you know, sometimes the agencies are probably going to ask, well, how do you expect us to operate? I said, well, you know, when, you, when, when there's just no money to go around, there's just no money. So we just got to find a way to do what we have. What do you guys, uh, how do you guys respond? And we've had the governor on to respond about this. I know uh, Carlo Branch came on, but the uh, Republicans uh, comment that this budget is a facade. Um, and I guess what, what they're saying is that it just doesn't add up. I mean, even in our mind, it doesn't, how could we only be getting 8% less money after we've been through all this stuff? So I, I guess, Senator, is it a facade? Because, I mean, there's just a whole lot of things we don't know about the process because you guys are doing it all behind closed doors. <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> the Republicans are going to say whatever they need to say. It's, only, it's election. Um, but we just call it uh, straight up. Um, Chris, uh, I got to run. I got a public hearing. But uh, Steve will, will continue asking a few, answering a few more questions. And, right on. And he knows where I'm coming from, and we're on the same sheet of music. Okay, Chris, Selena, thank, thank, thank you, you, Senator. Thanks, Senator. All right. All right, you ready, Steve? <laughs> I'm my best, Chris. Huh? Absolutely. Senator's like, ah, no, I gotta go. <laughs> you know, good luck. He, 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 leaves, he leaves me put, uh, to the wolves, but you know, yeah. I, I, I'll do my best to answer whatever question that you have. Yeah, I mean, I guess first question is like, how can it be that we're only getting eight percent less money in the middle of this pandemic, where it just doesn't add up in in so many people's minds? Well, well, you know, you know, Chris, what what's uh, uh, not amazing but expected? We got all this federal stimulus money floating on the island. Uh, the big difference is right now is that uh, a lot, uh, I would say that, uh, um, maybe half portion of it and maybe um, the new stimulus that Congress is working on, uh, the trillion dollars, uh, the three trillion, everybody keeps talking about, of course, that, that hasn't gone anywhere in the House yet. But what, what money we received here on Guam has kept us afloat, at least I, I would predict until up to December of this year. Um, a lot of the federal money will long, long be available next year, but should Congress again pass another stimulus budget, it might keep us going. It might keep us above that, 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 that drowning level. So we, we are anticipating, and it's hard to predict, and that's one of my biggest problems right now. The information that we use to, to, to project the FY21 is based on historical data but right now we can't rely too much on historical data because what's happening now is unpre unprecedented. It never happened before. So we can't put too much weight on what happened last year, two years, three years ago, because moving forward is, is something that we've never ever experienced. Nobody knows. Nobody wants to come out and make a definite and say, well, yeah, well in 12 months, yeah. we're, 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 we're gonna make a billion dollars. So do, you, so do you guys have any contingency plans then in place? Or are you just trying to wait till after the election because you don't want to bring it up now? No, 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 Chris, Chris, I'll tell you one thing right now. The numbers that I am presenting to Senator are, are numbers that I can support with data. 
with a little bit optimistic on some of my numbers. I, like everybody else, I'm crossing my fingers. It does materialize, but I don't think it's out of the park. You're like I the only optimistic achievable. person. Um, I'm actually, I'm, a, I'm pretty conservative, Chris. Uh, Everybody okay. knows me to be conservative. Okay. So I'm kind of like a little bit out of my, my comfort zone, but I'm willing to, to take this chance simply because of the unknowns. Mm -hmm. It can go either way. It can go up or it can go down. But, you know, being conservative, but yet I would say optimistic, I think we can do it. So what Guam if you don't see, place. what if We've you see a, very resilient. what if you see a, a, a significant drop in revenues other than what you've projected? I mean, what, what's the contingency plan? What's the backup plan? What kind of cuts are we going to have to make? You guys, uh, well, well, right now, if, are we if, winging you notice, it? If, if you notice, we, we've gotten a lot of poor money that's keeping all those people that are unemployed, you know, just kind of like hanging in there, meeting, meeting whatever needs they need. I mean, not, not to where they were pre-pandemic, but at least it's helping. So, you know, with, with, with areas like uh, withholding taxes, the income taxes and the BBT, all those kind of link together. Uh, if you don't have employment, we don't we don't collect uh, withholding. Um, people don't don't uh, don't find jobs. You know, uh, they they're not going to file their income tax. Uh, BBT, uh, there's no money circling in the economy. It's not going to collect. But like I said, all this all this money that's that's floating, and and with the help of the military, and and uh, all the other activities that's that's continuing despite what's happening is it's keeping it like i said afloat enough to get us by how so, long is the biggest question uh recovery period we i've heard periods from one year to three years i mean if it's going to take three years for guam to recover we're all in 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 really uh troubling time it's going to be a real difficult time and nobody would know what the heck's going to happen Steve, if, if push comes to shove, though, what GovGuam um, austerity measures um, would you recommend? For example, uh, reduce work hours, uh, furloughs, since we all know that payroll is obviously the biggest expense. Yeah, and, and, and payroll for GovGuam is the biggest, is the biggest expense. Um, right now, I mean, if we don't hit our revenue target levels, then there are... There's several options that can be taken, especially on the austerity side. And, you know, I mean, uh, we, GovGuam has gone through it before in the past right. when we come to really difficult times. Those those measures are still on the table. They're very much viable if we wanted to use it. How much and to what degree just depends, again, what the collections of GovGuam will be and what it can sustain its operation on. What are those measures? So, I mean, what are those measures? Uh, you, you can talk about... Um, uh, 32 hour work week. I mean, you can even go more than 32 hours if you need. I mean, Saipan, I think it was down to two or three days a week kind of thing, but those guys are really were suffering. You can, you know, uh, you can do, uh, there, there's, there's a early out. That, um, uh, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a option. If you've gone once, I mean, it may cost the government of Guam a little bit more to get these guys early out simply because of the payout of the lump sum of the annual leave and stuff. But I think long term, even in another two, three years, it may save government a lot of money. But, you know, you also have that. You have the furloughs as an option. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean the government could, has a lot of... You could cut the deputy she directors. She has a lot of options at her, at her disposal right now. What about, like, cutting the deputy directors? Again, that that is an administration's... Uh, uh, that's part of the administration's authority to do that. Uh, the only thing we can do right now is, uh, I mean, the legislature appropriates. Yeah, yeah, so but you guys are buddy buddy. So much. You're buddy buddy with the administration, so you should be like, hey, come on, come on, Gov, let's go, let's do it together. You know me, Chris. Chris, I I, I like to say <laughs> that's I'm, the problem I'm too, buddy buddy. Buddy buddies with them. I'm a working buddy buddy, buddy with working them. Buddy. Absolutely. Well, buddy, we we've got to wrap yeah, this we up. Run, buddy. <laughs> all right thank you Thanks, thank you Steve. so much good and luck i hope i was able to help you guys thank all you, right man. take care okay so wash your hands right. wash your thumbs wear your mask stay home <laughs> That's thank you. okay bye um it's nine o'clock we get one more guest and then we'll jump right into the after party uh i wanted to bring on uh, donna mila uh titano here onto our uh, zoom room um for no other reason other than she had written uh uh you got that brie uh, yeah, i'm gonna pull it okay Hey, by the way, we're jumping into it. This after party is going to be hot. I'm telling you, it's going to be, we got St. Nicholas supporters. We got Underwood supporters. 
I might not even have to talk. We're just like throw it over. So it's coming up. It's the after party. Uh, it's on the way. So uh, good morning, uh, Donna Mila. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Good, good morning. morning. So uh, Sabrina's going to go ahead and read off uh, some of your posts here, and then we'll, we'll kind of ask you a little bit about it. Right. So you, you posted this on Facebook. It says, Dear Governor, thank you for placing us in a place of unrest, uncertainty, and instability. Your leadership during this pandemic has pushed me into a mental state of fear and anxiety. Now that I've attended the orientation for my son's school this year, I am more in complete fear. I predict that as soon as my boss finds out that I cannot be at work, 11 out of 15 days that I will lose my job and in a week my bedridden mother myself and my son will be homeless because unlike you we don't have any other income but the one I was providing the continued closure of the senior care and dementia centers has tied my hands the partial opening of schools have tied my hands as the only adult and income provider I cannot hire anyone to come and care for my mother and my son so I could work how can we live on less than 20 hour weak income i worked hard for five years to earn just enough to not qualify for food stamp or housing assistance i paid my taxes and my bills since you've come to office i've lost the best insurance my money could buy i'm losing my job and the security it provided how is that your problem was about being a woman and empowering women but i'm a woman and i'm losing everything why am i the only person on this island asking these questions all of you keep telling me that we're in this together. Please provide me your information so that I can give it to my landlord, GPA, GWA, GTA, and all my other bills. Please send me a letter authorizing the use of your money so we can survive. Please make sure the letter is notarized. Some of you may laugh at my distress or roll your eye or dismiss me as being dramatic. You can go ahead. I'll be moving into your house with my son and my bedridden mom come August 8th. Please call GPA, GWA. GTA, NFCU, USDA, we just say you're paying for my bills. Send me a copy of the receipt and I'll thank you right here on Facebook. Donna, thank you for this. Thank you for this. Um, it's very courageous of you. It's stunning and brave that you would uh, put this out there, especially um, when uh, social media people are so quickly attacked for expressing opinions that are very valid. And these, these are very valid issues. What drove you to post this on Facebook? Um, I think it's it's a continuation of many of my posts since the decisions have been made. Um, I think this one just, so today's supposed to be my last day because I don't know how I can meet the requirements of my job, but I know I'm afraid. I didn't want to cry, but Sabrina, when you read that, I'm just like, thrown back into the decisions that they're making and everyone is you know I, I I commend DP Department of Public Health GDOE all the people that have been working trying to keep our island afloat and many families and and many people on the island have, have reached out to help each other you know um, I know families that are help are buying cases of chicken to share with families that don't have any money right now who've lost jobs especially those in the in the tourist industry um and not just tourist industry just basic um small families i'm sorry i'm crying no donna just, i mean this is something to cry about it's it's overwhelming um i i run a um i have a group of friends that try and help people out you know, we're not like Juanita who has this this system that she has, but because, you know, their hands are tied too, um, a lot of people are suffering. And honestly, we're, we're coming to a point where we're not gonna be able to help people. We're not gonna be able to reach out to others because our hands are tied. Um, our income isn't that great. I mean, you guys know that, but still people in Guam, they will, they will, use their last $20 to buy so that someone else doesn't get hungry or share clothes that, that they could, you know, maybe they only have five pairs of pants, but they'll give two away so that someone else can wear it. But um, everyone's trying their best, but I keep asking myself, what is the source of why we're having this problem? And it's the decisions that are being made. Um, I'm so frustrated with this COVID team advisors for the governor, the governor and all of that because GDOE is trying to do their best, but everyone is afraid because of the way they're presenting their data. 
I don't understand how a doctor who spent 10 years studying and more so can't do a statistical analysis, simply uh, get out a calculator and and calculate what is what are we looking at? Um, five, five deaths and not to dismiss deaths or, or devalue their death, but five deaths in four months out of 180,000 people, that's 0.05%. And we are holding hostage our whole island. And I, I'm just so, um, I just can't believe people can't think. We're, we're closing businesses like, you know, good businesses because one person walked in with so supposedly asymptotic symptoms, right? But we don't even know if if they're the, the tests themselves are actual positive tests. Test. If you've gone through these tests, you're going to get a little piece of paper that says, uh, even though you're negative, you still have to stay home for 14 days or seven days because you may have something. Um, you go to one testing site and they say, oh, you're not going to know the results until seven days or five days later. But then they're posting it that night. 51 people were tested. Seven of them are positive. But when you go to these testing sites, you cannot have symptoms and get tested there. That means everyone that got tested there are asymptotic. And so what is what are they saying that people that this disease is not causing people to be sick? If it's not being if they're not getting sick, they're not in the hospital, they're not whatever, why are we holding this whole economy hostage? Why are families that are running businesses, businesses that paid 5% GRT closing down? why why are we why are we shutting down this economy why why can't and you know my my biggest test for this whole question is payless payless has been open home depot has been open all of these so-called essential places that that need to run um to provide basic necessities for guam have been open has anyone gone to payless and tested these employees that have been exposed to everyone on guam has, has anyone ever reported that Payless, um, you're telling me that all the people that walked into Payless since day one of March 16 and this announcement, not one person that walked into Payless had asymptotic um, symptoms. And Payless has is, is, is been doing their best. They even put out this, this iPad that measures your temperature <laughs> just so you can come into their store. But guess what? If you're asymptotic, then you don't have a temperature. You're still going to walk in. You're still going to be exposing people. So my question is, if they're asymptotic, is it contagious? Is it the same thing that's making someone severely sick? Is it the same, is it the same um, strain that's causing people to die? If they're not, then why are people still walking around asymptotic and it's okay? Why are they having people come to one place to be tested and you don't know if the person standing next to you or the person that's giving the test is asymptotic Donna, we, we, they don't have symptoms we definitely feel your frustration uh, unfortunately we've got to we got to move on to our next uh, segment but i wanted to bring you on because people feel what what you're saying they feel what you post in, <clears throat> in their facebook and a lot of it is we just have this initial reaction where we just want to vent and and put it out there and and that's what I, I really felt in, in your post. Um, and we'll keep in touch. Let me know how it goes for you. Um, is there anywhere? It, it sounds like you really need help. We, we put uh, your Facebook out. Is there any other help that, that you need that you want to ask people for? I, I, I don't want help for myself. I want people to help others who don't have a job right now, who are stuck. That's the people I want you to help. Okay, Donna. Thanks, God, Donna. God bless you, Donna. God bless you guys too. Take Thank care. you. Wash your hands and be safe, okay? And we'll, we'll pray for you. All right, 909. Uh, let's do it. KUAM News uh, Decision 2020. Of course, uh, we do the candidate interviews Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday um, from 9 to 10. And we're doing the senatorial. We'll move into mayor, vice mayors, congressional, public auditor, all that good stuff uh, as we get close to the primary election. But on Fridays, we do a fun segment called the after party and um basically we just bring a bunch of people on uh some of them are in politics some of them are in business some of them are 
people like us who just got <laughs> uh, who doesn't have an opinion. Right. Uh, so let's uh, bring on our uh, panel this morning. Uh, is that everybody? Yep. Okay, so we have uh, a Dr. Uh, Michael uh, Bevacqua. Of course, he's been on a bunch of after parties. You guys know him. Uh, we have Beauty uh, Camacho, who we actually got her, and because we knew that a lot of the discussion was going to be kind of Underwood, St. Nicholas, uh, Bree and I kind of went on that because St. Nicholas is so strong on social media. We went on the social media and we kind of were like looking at who comments a lot on the in mm-hmm. support of uh, the congressman. And so we, we've got Beauty Camacho. Thank you, Beauty, for uh, Hi, first beauty. of all accepting the invite and not thinking i'm a total weirdo for calling you randomly (laughs) i mean i was like i got your number off facebook i'm sure you heard that one before (laughs) so you you literally oh no my number number is absolutely public right right (laughs) Uh, and then of course uh we have uh mr nothing burger himself uh mike israel good morning mike uh i love the comments of the lady yeah i was I, i figured you would uh, Pete Santos and Pete Santos is a, a guy again, always uh, very active on uh, social media, uh, and I think he's got a cool perspective. So we wanted to bring him on. Good morning, Pete. Good morning, Chris. How are you doing? We're doing pretty good. Uh, Joni Kerr also. Uh, we we brought on um, uh, Joni. Good morning, Joni. Good morning, half a day. And Joni is from the Fanogi Coalition, and we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, start there. Um, Joni, there was a, a forum that you guys had held uh, the other day, and um, prior to that, Congressman uh, Sir Nicholas uh, had held a press conference and had said that um, he was, uh, you know, wanting to participate in any virtual forums or debates, but that he didn't know of any. And you guys had um, actually maybe even over-invited him uh, to this uh, Fanogi Coalition uh, debate. So maybe if you could uh, just give us your reaction to him being a no-show and... and um, no, we'll just start well, there. I think he called, right? Yeah, he called uh, yeah, 45 happened? minutes before okay. or something like that. Yeah, so I didn't know that. So j- just give us the, the info, Joni. Well, I think um, Mike Bavacco would like to certainly chime in on this. <laughs> uh, it was disappointing to not have the congressman um, participate in the forum because I think it just would have and much better for him to show up. I think even probably his supporters would have liked to have seen him come on in some way shape or form uh he was invited to even have a um have it recorded uh pre-recorded uh and that would have been fine as well um and then the because he didn't uh he actually did not respond to us directly i don't believe he ever did that and um uh we we things had to move on and it was decided to have a question, a Q&A session in place of the time that had been allotted that would have been his on the forum. Yes, I-, uh, I can speak to that too. Yeah. Okay. Um, because we, we had really wanted to make every effort knowing the difficulties that the current congressman has in the states, the time difference, sort of the whatever schedule he has. So in the initial invitation, which was sent out about three and a half weeks ago um he was he was told that he could record it ahead of time or he could do it live that that it would not be one where that we were we wanted to give each candidate the chance to speak on their own terms not debate each other so each person would get 20 to 25 minutes and um we emailed it to his office we delivered it to his office uh we tagged him on social media we sent him messages on facebook and messages were sent via WhatsApp. Hmm. And he never formally responded to any of them. And at the last minute, um, we had people who were messaging him who told him that if he, was, if he couldn't make it himself, he could have a representative come hmm. and at least hmm. share his right. position hmm. on it. And we never got a response right. until 45 minutes before, and we never received any direct response. What happened 45 so, minutes before? He messaged somebody who is a member of the coalition. Okay, uh, Beauty on we'll, WhatsApp. We'll take it over to you as a, as a Congressman Sir Nicholas um, supporter. Uh, it really sounds like these guys went above and beyond, and this is something that we deal with. And we're a media outlet. I mean, we don't get response from uh, the congressman. So, how would you? I mean, I guess first of all, as a supporter, would you have liked to see to have seen Congressman Sir Nicholas uh, participate in this uh, forum? Hi guys, like I mentioned, I'm I'm not very political. Mm-hmm. I try to do my community service as best I can and represent myself and the 
organizations that I represent. So, you know, like I don't necessarily follow a lot of of the um, candidates during election time. I do my research before it's time to vote. And I don't necessarily get into all the dabble, the mm. back and forth and all of that. So I like to just stay to myself and keep a level head until it's really time to vote. And I like to stay um, on the positive side of things and look at the positive points um, within all the candidates. So I'm not really a congressman, Cynic List supporter or an Underwood supporter or, a, um, you know, any anybody else. I want to make sure that I educate myself before I say that I'm going to be supporting anyone. Mm. Um, until I see something happen in, in front of my face and and live, that's when I'll have an opinion for a direct event, but not necessarily something that's, you know, ov- online or through text because tones get, tones are misunderstood sometimes and we, we won't be able to see that unless it's a face-to-face reaction. Mm. Um, but that is an opportunity that you guys gave him and for me as an event planner i think three weeks might have been a a bit short for a congressman's schedule but like you said you gave over five different avenues to connect with him and he must have gotten it uh early on or within time to be able to respond to you guys within 45 minutes uh mike is comment Mike Israel, uh, just, I'm sorry, Beauty. Uh, Mike, so forums. Okay. I mean, let's keep it general, right? Should you know congressmen and and should they attend all these forums to get their the message out to the people? Or what do you think of it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, part of the job of a public servant is to address the public, our bo- the boss. Um, it'd be the equivalent of uh, the boss calling and saying, "Hey, we'd like a report," and and uh, one of my employees telling me, "Eh, I'm kind of busy. I'll see you later." Uh, so I, I don't agree on that. On the other hand, who do I support for Congress? Well, that's easy. I'm in the tradition of everybody from Guam. We support family. So that'll be Madeline Berdayo. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys go make hey, of Chris, the... Chris, can I, can I address Pete? the... Uh, Pete, yeah, go ahead, Pete. There? Yeah, because we missed you. Sorry. Sure. So um, three and a half weeks. I, I, I would uh, respectfully disagree. Three and a half weeks is a lot of time. I mean, he... he he did an impromptu forum the day before right. without very much notice. Uh, he came out with a press release after, you know, this is to dovetail and add to the information uh, that uh, Mike provided, Mike Bavakwa provided. He, he sent out a press release saying that, you know, he was tied up with a meeting and then he didn't say what it was. Well, actually, that, that was his response. But then he sent out a press release and now we know that he was involved in the XM. Uh, bank, uh, uh, export, import bank uh, forum that they had. You know, I'm sure he knew long in advance about that, right? So what is the takeaway from this? So he, he does have a legitimate excuse. I would give him that. But he never said anything until 45 minutes before the forum that's been planned and publicized. What is the takeaway from that? What is the messaging? What is the signaling? What is the optics of that? He just does not care about us. Uh, what about the? Um, uh, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm not really. I'm sort of the outsider looking in. I'm more of the economy and money. I mean, I was much more sympathetic with the prior speaker. Uh, that really got exactly what my my message has been about. Yeah. Um, on the Finogi, I understand that it is an activist group. Uh, they do have a very specific point of view. And I can sympathize a little bit with Mike San Nicholas in that he probably was concerned about being ambushed or questions like that. Uh, but of course, I'm ignorant. If Finogi could uh, educate a little bit, um, when you hold this forum, do you include a list of questions or topics on which you want to have a discussion on? Or was it more of, we're talking, why don't you join our conversation? Just kind of curious. I mean. And so um, for, the, for the congressional forum, the, they did receive the topics and the questions ahead of time. And uh, we were, and the candidates were encouraged, though, to take the conversation in whatever direction they felt to to explain their record, and to talk about their plans and their goals. So, um, so yeah, there was, yeah, and so it was because um, the as Joni can as Joni can also elaborate, the Fanogi Coalition is thirty seven different uh, groups, um, different organizations, uh, some of whom are not traditional activist groups; they're more just uh, community organizations. Uh, Couple small businesses are part of it, um, and Joni, do you did you want to elaborate on that? 
Yeah. Um, when the, first, the group first formed, this was um, prior to the Fanogi March last year, uh, there was a round table uh, with the governor uh, to address um, things about the firing range. But some of those groups, actually all of those groups that were at the table eventually became part of the Fanogi Coalition. And some of the people at the table were, were actually small business owners. Um, so it's not, this group is, is very diverse. Um, there are academics and uh, tradespeople. There are um, students. Uh, there are women. Who, women it's, there are women's groups who are really concerned about this, the social wel welfare and well-being of women. Uh, there's the Young Men's Association, or the Young Men's League of Guam. Right, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, so, now we get it. it, and, it and is environmental a, groups right, as yeah, well. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I was just, like I said, I'm not involved with these uh, forums, I think, and I know that as a speaker myself, I kind of like to know what the conversation is, what the format is, yeah. uh, how it's going to be conducted, so that way you can be prepared and, and right. not a, a, a gotcha moment. Just, but, just uh, but I think and I'm glad to hear that you are doing that, and that's excellent, and therefore... Uh, if I if I were and I am not a politician, <laughs> um, I would always want to try and take as many opportunities to reach as many people, even people who may disagree with me. Right. I could at least set out exactly yeah. um, why I why I think we're that's not a fair ballot, or you know why I disagree with your group, or blah blah blah. To the extent I even had an opinion, because I'm I'm not a politician. And, and right. Mr. Israel, Mr. Israel, re recall that. Um, the group had given him the opportunity to pre-record a message or send a representative. Right, yeah, yeah, Pete, but he, we he we took get neither that, of those. That we really bent over backwards to try and get the congressman. And and on the gotcha moment, Mike, I think that if you're at that level of elected office, you should be well versed on all the issues that are uh, facing the target. <laughs> let's let's switch a little bit here. I want to take it to beauty. Let's talk uh, the negative uh, campaigning. So. We have on the one side uh, the challenger, right, uh, Congressman Underwood, who's bringing up uh, these issues that have been reported on uh, locally and nationally with the ethics uh, subcommittee investigation, with uh, some of the campaign finance. So these are things that are on the congressman's record, but uh, they're being characterized as negative uh, campaigning. Just what are your thoughts on that, uh, Beauty? Right, and that's just so funny because I only saw one yesterday. And for me, a lot of the dramatics play into it where you're adding background music and uh, really <laughs> really dramatic type of like that just that just turns me off and I, I i definitely move on to the next thing that i was about to do so like i said i'm not political at all and if if i do get any ads like that i i shut it out it doesn't even it doesn't even phase me and i actually kind of put it as a negative tick on the on both parties rather than just just giving it to underwear you know you know what i mean like yeah. if if i'm gonna see that type of um advertisement it's like oh wow that that's the route that they're gonna take it doesn't it doesn't seem very mature to me and um uh as a positive person that's just not the attitude that i want to have in congress so to, when you to see, have someone representing that so when you see let's say uh, these nice fluffy type of uh, political ads you know i'm a father hmm. you know i've got these great legislative aides does that work for you then not necessarily as well yeah. i'm i'm kind of neutral <laughs> with that also because everybody is a family member you know we all have we you can you can post your you can post your dog for for all i care i, I want to see results right, yeah. i want to see the results of what you what you've done i want to see who are the people who are the real people that are working for you and representing you right um like i mentioned with uh speaking with chris for a little bit um I really only am familiar with uh, Congressman Sir Nicholas through his through his aide to Nelta Mori, and she she and I went to school together. Right. And because I believe in her, and I believe in her work ethic and her attitude and everything that she's done in school, I know that I can support who she's representing. Right. Um, and I and I trust her guidance through that. So even if she does move on to another party, that's who I'm going to most likely follow as well because i follow the people who i know are working or who i've also worked with i get it. i enjoy yeah i enjoy the authenticity and i like to see the results from people who are not necessarily you can't really just say um i'm the congressman this is all of the stuff that i've done i like to see who's helped them get to that point right. 
And I'd like, I like to see their acknowledgement of all the people within their team, not necessarily them taking credit for everything that their office has, um, you know, put through. You know, uh, it's a, and we'll just take it to the panel after this, but it, it's such an interesting thing that we have on the one side, these very tangible and very real issues and concerns with the congressman in terms of this ethics subcommittee investigation and the charges that he interfered with it. And to me, it, it's tough because on the one hand, to someone like Beauty, uh, this and a lot of people, it seems like negative campaigning. But on the other, don't you think the voters need to know that what are what are the consequences of this so after the election are right. are we going to see this investigation ramp up i mean how serious is it are we looking at a possible resignation I, and so i feel like on the one hand we can totally talk about this because it's right. totally on the congressman's record but i can see how uh people are turned off by it but then i also can see how it can be spun into a defense so i guess we'll just take it to the right. panel yeah. your thoughts on this because negative campaigning I- seems to be the buzzword so yeah, hey, I uh, think Chris, can I can I chime in? Oh sorry. Go ahead, you guys are on your own. Yeah, oh, okay. uh, Chris. Go ahead, Pete. The game. The game. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I wanted to just clarify something, Chris. Uh, you 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 uh, introduced this panel uh, as San Nicolas supporters and Underwood supporters. I am in no way affiliated with the Underwood campaign. Right. I uh, I'm I'm not actually an Underwood supporter per se, uh, because I just think that either Will Castro or Congressman Underwood is the better alternative to Sir Nicholas. And as a matter of fact, like Sir Nicholas, I was thinking of hiring a high powered DC lawyer to sue Congressman Underwood because that negative ad campaign has been all the talking points I've been saying for months. So (laughs) I'm saying that in joking, but you know, it's not, it's not, it's not a negative ad. And you know, here's, here's the, the, the reaction that uh, Michael St. Nicholas had uh, during his, uh, his uh, uh, question and answer period uh, in response to uh, Congressman Underwood's um, live feed thing. He said, we're gonna stay positive and, and, and stay away from the negative, but that's just more of him fooling the people. Michael St. Nicholas has been using negative attacks since months and then he also has a pr firm that has been doing it for him it's called candid news or candid fake news because they <laughs> publish all these sunshine stories about michael St. Nicholas, and then they 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 publish all these attack stories on his political adversaries yeah. and everyone knows that michael St. Nicholas funds candid news they're his pr firm mm. that's all candid news really is all right M- uh, Maget? so oh so yeah, I, I think um, one of the things why I don't think that this this ad would feel so negative because one of the things about it is that the words are all taken from news pieces and from documents that are produced by the U.S. Congress. So very little of it actually comes from the Underwood campaign itself. So it is just stuff that's out there in the public record. It, it is made to look very serious, of course. But one of the reasons why it feels very jarring to people is because that the congressman hasn't really talked to the community about these issues directly. Usually when you're confronted with something like this, you have to go through a period where you really explain it to people. So if it's, if it's wrong, if it's inaccurate, if it's, if it's not factual, you know, you have to have a conversation with people to help them understand these points. But there hasn't been a lot of that. There's Facebook messages, you know, every once in a while. But in terms of having just an open forum, in terms of sitting down at length with the media and talking about it. I mean, when you think about other politicians that face similar types of scandals, you have to sit down with the media for a while. And if you, if you want to show that whatever happened is not true or you're sorry about it and you want to move ahead, there has to be that period of openness where you are transparent, where you're talking to people and you have to deal with the criticism because as was said earlier, you're an elected leader. You know, you're an elected official, so the people chose you, which means that if the people have concerns, you have to be open to those concerns, even if you don't want to hear them, even if they frustrate you, even if they irritate you, you have to be open to that because that's part of what a democratically elected leader is supposed to do. 
Mm-hmm. I wanted to. Uh, pick- Can I follow up on that with yeah. uh, on my okay. uh, comments? Um, there, um, there is a perspective that I can share. Um, it wasn't mine. It's actually one of my uh, relatives. But she says that as a as a freshman congressman, to be to already be in, engaged or embroiled in an ethics uh, an ethics investigation, that's kind of you know it, it raises big questions, and 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 it raises even larger questions when when your congressman does not address them and calm the people down, his supporters down or his people down. Um, it, it's, it's not a good look for the congressman. That's what I, that's what I need to say and get out there. It's, uh, it, it makes you more suspicious. Um, and also, I, you know, Underwood is very, um, he's been transparent about how this, his information was, was, um, obtained it is in the public record and and i i mean <laughs> i'm just thinking that that um mike and nicholas um uh, as a congressman also has this he's obligated he's obligated to explain himself really mm-hmm. he is in the public eye and um i don't know if he's taking hints from pleading the fifth or something like that because there are advantages to keeping silent but um in any case it it does raise many questions Mm -hmm. too many questions um you know mike i know that um your your godzu your auntie madeline is not uh running in this (laughs) this election but if you had a chance to watch what's been going on in the congressional race between uh well actually yeah, that's a that's the very first question. Um, so the point of view from the guy uh, literally living under a rock in Tumon, um, I haven't actually seen any of these ads. I am aware of the ethics uh, complaints filed by Michael San Nicholas, as probably the oldest person in this group. Um, I'm kind of surprised uh, uh, former Congressman uh, Underwood would be using the negative campaign on a sec, you know, sexual, we love negative campaigns on the wall. Um, but the sex part never really works out because, um, you know, people, they, it's always been a, uh, my experience has been in politics on Guam is allegations of sexual improprieties have always backfired. And, um, that a lot of times people get um, mad at someone bringing up what they consider interpersonal family. I, I'm not necessarily agreeing with it. I'm just yeah. saying my observation of having the yeah. oldest person in the group here is that we are very, very forgiving island, especially when it comes to sex. Uh, mm. Our island theme song, uh, Johnny, uh, what's the, uh, oh gosh, <laughs> Shame and old Scandal. Dementia here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Shame, Shame and Scandal, scandal <laughs> in the family, you know, we all know it, you know? Yeah. And um, so, but maybe, maybe Guam is changing. Maybe yeah. we're becoming more like the state. It's just against the rules, changing. Mike. I mean, it's against the, <laughs> I mean, you're right. The, the people of Guam, right. they don't care about where you stick your tallywhacker because we've got this attractive <laughs> culture. Let's just be honest, you know? Oh, we've, no, no, no. We, right? No, yeah. No, we we tolerate we it. Yeah. 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 We don't do it publicly. We, we yeah. do it through the family. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We chat my, around my, the fence. So Mr. that's Israel, that's the thing is it's against the rules. This is not yeah. just a Mike's question. <laughs> right. This is Mike. This is not just a question of him having improprieties with a with a female that wasn't his wife. This is about a congressional staffer, which is against, which is a violation of the the rules, the congressional rules, and that is why there isn't. I mean, that is one of the reasons why he's under an ethics investigation. Besides the financial question, right. you know, his misuse of funds. Beauty. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not, um, again, uh, sex. Again, qu- we're from it, it was a violation. Yeah. Yes. And again, yes. these and are just so, allegations. This is a violation. These are just of allegations. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a congressional rule. You, he, uh, that he oh, yeah. allegedly or could have right, violated. Right. So that's why the investigation is taking place. Beauty, so. do you care? Do, do people care about who Congressman Sir Nicholas may or may not be sleeping with? No, I don't necessarily I care. That's that's your business. That's your preference. But if I were to, if I'm in your staff and I open that door and I see you, then I'm I'm re- reporting it. That is that is when I will bring about the you know um, going against our ethics and going against our our laws, and that's just not right. 
but for me yeah. to hear to hear just gossip and rumors no i cannot base it off of that unless i can definitely see that that's what's engaging right <laughs> in front of my face <laughs> right. and i'm able to report it that same day within 30 minutes or less right. that's something that i will be able to do right and these are allegations without but, hesitation because that's that's just not they're allegations that the congress has you know taken very very seriously at multiple levels they've right. escalated right so uh, I'm right. curious, uh, for me, beauty, in, in terms for of me personally, oh, oh sorry, yeah, in for terms of ad the, addressing these okay, um, these okay. allegations, what would you like to hear from Congressman Sir Nicholas? Because uh, could couldn't he? I mean, couldn't he just come out and say, "I'm sorry, I didn't do it. We're going to beat this." Because in this press conference, he just flat out said, "I can't talk about it at all." So right. I mean, and uh, it seems like there is some oh. advisorship coming from somebody else. Right. Um, but, you know, with, with like Mr. Israel mentioned, with sex and scandal being something that can propel somebody's campaign or bring it, bring it backwards, it's such an easy way to get things going through a conversation and not just um, an office, a conversation within the office, conversation throughout your entire political campaign. So it's going to be, from a marketing aspect, that's going to be something something that people are going to continue to talk about and talk about and talk about and are we are we trying to imprint his name within the conversation all the time so that um his name is brought about or is it something that's actually uh like for for example a fake scandal right if it's that that's just some type of marketing ploy or is it something that that is genuinely a concern for him and his family like of course, people will be definitely embarrassed about um, allegations of, of sex and scandal, but there's just so many there's just so many avenues to take with that. Um, like I said, unless I see it for myself, it's it's not something that I'm going to have an opinion on because I'm not educated or being or or not witnessed uh, haven't witnessed enough of that to really have an opinion. Right, but I mean that doesn't mean you you don't have a valid perspective. I, I think it's cool that you don't come from the same background as any of these people. Uh, guys, we're going to take a short break. Okay, we'll, we'll be right back with more of the after party on the link. The breeze ninety three nine. Good morning. Tomorrow is built on GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648 7867 for more information. We got your six at 6 a.m. with the link on Breeze 93.9 FM. Bree and I connect you with all the latest news and information what are the you need to know to start your day. Then check back with Guam's news leader at 6 p.m. for the day's top headlines with KUAM News Prime Time. From 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and everything else in between with KUAM Digital, we got your six.
GU Self Storage, conveniently located near the Harmon McDonald's. We offer affordable rates, online payments, and auto bill pay for your convenience. Plus, gate access daily from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Call us today at 648-7867 for more information. Viva Fitness, it's the link, the breeze, 93.9. All right. We're trying to get a, a guy. So um, we'll pod back up the Zoom room. And, you know, and, and, um, and trying to put this uh, panel together, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to character characterize you guys all either as Underwood or St. Nicholas uh, supporters. I think what I had said was that we had some um, on uh, both sides. And so, and again, beauty, we had just seen that you had commented and supported the Congressman on a couple articles. And so I just maybe got a little ahead of myself and assumed. Oh that, no, it's okay. Yeah, no could. problem at all. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's talk about social media, right? Um, this, this whole social media thing. I mean, Congressman, Oh, I thought we had some comments on sex still. <laughs> <laughs> now we got the memo from up top. Turn the page on the. It was when I said tallywhacker. They were like, "No, oh, that's it. Done. Too bad. I'm done. <laughs> You're done, son." Uh, so yeah, the social media thing. I mean, uh, it, he just the presence on social media. It's ginormous. Mm-hmm. Um, is that going to translate into results at the at the ballot box? And maybe if you guys could I go. I think it's both sides. I mean, just in, in now, like I've seen a lot of like Congressman Underwood. Right. Uh, um, he has like even like little newscasts and stuff on, yeah. on his uh, on his Facebook page, and Will Castro he's been all over social media right. as well. So, so social media is a big battleground, especially in this uh, COVID um, time. And Congressman Nicholas has the edge, I, I think. So, um, how key is social media uh, for you guys during this primary election in terms of the the uh, delegate race? Oh, social for me, social media is is absolutely key because. In the absence of a lot of the face-to-face direct contact that you have with the community, the the impressions on social media are are vital. So one of the th- strengths that the congressman, the current congressman, does have is that people tend to feel that he has a very large following on social media, that he's very strong on Facebook, and so that then translates to a lot of people that are more independent-minded voters. They're not for any particular party. They're kind of floating around and. You know, and so if they feel that there's an impression that he's popular on social media, well, then they're more likely to possibly give him a vote. They may not be strong supporters of him necessarily, but there's a good number of people that because they feel that he's popular or has a commanding presence, that they will sort of lean in his direction. And, you know, we see that. We see that in more and more uh, campaigns, you know, not just on Guam, but elsewhere, that if you have a reputation on social media, um, it can actually translate into more votes for you, even if those people don't necessarily know your record or have mm-hmm. strong feelings about you. It's it's what they usually call sort of inevitability, right? Is that if you if people feel like you are likely to win, sometimes they'll they'll just vote in your direction, you know, to sort of be part of that. But so I think that um, for the other campaigns, sort of taking away that that power and that reputation from Mike and Nicolas. So sort of challenging him on Facebook, but also taking advantage of the fact that he has almost no presence on any other social media platform. 
Right. Or because on an island, for that matter. Uh, but, hey. You know, the social media, <laughs> though, for me, like, I, it, I, it doesn't work necessarily for me. Yeah, yeah. You can have all the numbers and what have you. But what does work for me is, is the forums and, and the debates, it, whether it's held virtually or whatever, so that you can hear and you can see um, that interaction. But, I mean, Beauty, your thoughts on, on social media and what you see and these nice pre-produced... Uh, Commercials um, you know, like and I said, going going back, not not to bring up the scandal again, but mm. from a marketing point, right? The Mister Israel is laughing. To, <laughs> to, from a marketing point, it takes like about sixteen impressions for, for someone to really start to engage into your brand or into anything that you're trying to represent, and all of the things that are being brought up about him, um, him or anyone else in general are conversation starters because we don't have the answers to them yet so people are going to go ahead and bring about all their all their own theories and it's going to be a discussion that people do want to get involved in um for me too i agree i i do like listening in on forums but that's if that's if i even have the the time for it um but i do like to replay any live videos or um like i said before it's voting time that's when i start doing my homework not kind of last minute but you know i want i do enjoy getting more information compiled that's just how my brain works right. um to to sort and compare and contrast because if i follow an entire campaign or um or somebody who's going against um another candidate another candidate it's my brain's going to just get overloaded and i'm going to want to I, I need to be able to compare and contrast um table by table right. within a shorter period of time uh, I think on my end, social media doesn't really work for me because I know with social media, for example, my own social media, it's the reality that I want you guys to see, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't right. ever post when I get mad at my kids or I don't ever get post when I'm depressed or I don't ever post right. my, you know, fat angle or, you know what I mean? So it's an artificially uh, crafted or it's just a crafted reality. And so I don't see... Uh, Right. I, I mean, it actually turns me off. What I see is like, God, are you guys just on Facebook all the time? That's really how I, I feel. I mean, I post on social media because part of it's my job just to maintain a, a presence, you know. But really, man, this and on both sides, uh, on Underwood supporters too, it's like, let's say these guys are just like on Facebook all the time. And I feel that way with the congressman as well. I just feel like it's unhealthy. It's really unhealthy how much time people are spending on, on social media. So we'll just, uh, I guess, Mike, I'm curious what your answer is about this. I don't even know if you have a Facebook. I, I do not have Facebook. Uh, I, I do get a, I have a blank Facebook account simply so I can track my kids. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I have absolutely no use for Facebook. Uh, but I do know that social media is very important. Uh, from my standpoint, I'm grateful for social media because maybe it'll reduce the number of road signs. Hmm. Um, you know how Guam's tradition, we start plastering all the roads of all these uh crazy signs all over the place. So I'm hoping that social media might move some of those road signs into a form that's a little more controllable. Um, I, I think it's important I, I, as a campaign, uh, it's multi-pronged. You always have to be multi-pronged. And social media is one aspect. I know that Mike San Nicholas uh, beat my aunt through social media. Uh, she's older than I, and therefore, but we won't admit that. Um, and therefore, she had no clue about social media, and social media really walloped her. Uh, Mike's uh, opponent this time, uh, Senator Underwood, as well as Will Castro, uh, took hey notes. Guys, and uh, go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Oh, um, and so basically, um, they're they're now doing that, which has diminished the effectiveness of social media. Like you said, you get sort of inundated. Uh, everybody has to have a new thing. And I think we might actually be going back to the future where people are going to say, okay, okay, we got all that social media, which is nice fluff stuff. But, but now let's start looking at their positions. Um, I think the positions are going to be very, very important. Um, I think um, uh, it'd be very nice if the news, I mean, I mean, I know media, there's voice media and visual media, but there's also print media. And I think a lot of people, when it comes time for voting, we like to, put it down and read and, and compare their different positions. So for instance, the question I would ask is, is, psych, is it, out of the three candidates, who would be the most favorable toward the military buildup? Who would be least favorable toward the military buildup? And 
that may impact your vote. Uh, which one wants a closer relationship um, to the United States? Which one would like a little more distant relationship with the United States? Uh, those I think are gonna be the big serious questions. As far as the little sex of uh, Mike's and Nicholas, it's not a Alleged. positive. Um, my, my only request for him is that if he does address it, to not lie. If it's not a good answer you can give without it being a lie, uh, my recommendation is do what he's doing, which is no comment, and this will be handled through the proper cho- uh, uh, channels in Congress. Right, it's a good holding not statement. not to get into debate. Yeah. Um, uh, Bill Clinton famously had an affair with Monica Lewinsky some time ago, and I didn't mind him having an affair with Monica Lewinsky. I know it's all wrong and all that, but you know, of all the things he did, that would be really low on the ranking. But what I really resented was when he got on the air and he lied yeah. with the finger and pointed and made a bare I false did not lie. Have sexual lying to your woman. lying to your boss, not good. Being a little bit of a human, it's forgivable. We're all yeah. Christians. Yeah, good point, Mike. Uh, guys, we're gonna uh, technically. I don't know how this is gonna work, but hey, to God. might as well go for it. Uh, but we're bringing up on the I'll phone work. because they couldn't figure out the Zoom. Uh, we got a couple. I mean, and I will say these guys are Congressman and Nicholas supporters. Uh, Raleigh Zabala. I mean, I think this guy comments on every single thing that comes out about. And then we've got uh, Bobby Zamora. Uh, good morning. You guys there? Bobby and Raleigh? Our time on the audio. We can get the Zoom, but the audio is not working. Right. Yeah. So we got you on the air now. Guys, are you there? Yeah. Raleigh's there. Can you guys hear Raleigh and, and Bobby? Barely, very little. Speak up, guys. Uh, Raleigh and Bobby? Yeah. Hi, good morning. Good morning. All right, so um, can you guys hear now? Can you On the Zoom, can you guys hear Raleigh and, and Bobby? Raleigh yeah. and Bobby, say something. Yeah. How are you? Good. So tell us why. Yeah, uh, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear us? No. I can call. I can try you in WhatsApp. Mm. Okay, maybe that's not gonna work. <laughs> so that's the rare example yeah. of Michael and Nicholas not being able to use uh, electronic media. Well, my my thoughts on his use of social media, uh, it's more scary now because of the pandemic, because now people are gonna rely more on mm. social media, and that's how he's been able to control his f- false narrative and uh, proliferate his propaganda. Uh, But for those who understand and know that, uh, or who have done the research rather, uh, and and are vocal like myself, uh, and and calling him out, you know, it's it's more important for us. And I'm seeing more and more people challenge him. It seemed like uh, there was only one or two of us, uh, you know, for months challenging Michael Sinicholas on the press releases that he puts out and the false narratives that he's been putting out on social media. Uh, But like Mr. Israel said, that's just one component. It's a, it's a very important component, but Michael St. Nicholas also has a very, very well oiled machine in his ground game. Uh, His, his, his uh, right hand man is Benji Perez and uh, Benji has a lot of support. I think Benji is actually his Achilles heel. If ever anyone were to take uh, Benji away from Michael Sinicholas, Michael Sinicholas would just, you know, drown. And uh, so Benji is his, is his arm, uh, his right-hand man, his muscle. So uh, aside from social media, his other um, strong uh, part of his game, his political machinery, is is Benji Paris, and then we've got Cotton Candy as well. Hmm. Guys, what about uh, the? Uh, how would you rate the three uh, delegate candidates uh, in terms of their relationships uh, and accessibility uh, with the media? Well, I mean, I think you can. The Michael Sinicolas is clearly the last one in terms of that, just because, and and he doesn't have to be. There's nothing that says that, I mean, some politicians do use the strategy of, of, of running against the media, right? So that they kind of argue that the media is fake news, the media is, is not trustworthy, so that's why we don't trust them. And, you know, but, uh, but it goes far beyond that. I mean, I know about his uh, exciting and dramatic 
sort of soap opera relationship with KOEM, for example, how it's uh, it's never will they, won't they? It's just he won't, he won't, he won't. Oh, but it's and election so, now, and we got a press conference the other day. <laughs> no, and and so, but the thing is, yeah, and that's you know that's why for me a lot of these issues, they're they're critical, they're important. But one of the things that's most worrisome for me is that his office just produces far less than any other congressional office in terms of press releases, in terms of reports, in terms of things for the public to read. I mean, his website was almost empty for, for, for months and months and months, for, for almost an entire year. They redid it several times, but every month I would go back to see what was there and there was almost nothing there. And so, but the thing is that if you're an elected leader on a national level, then it's not just the things that you do directly because it's hard to get bills passed in Congress. Thousands are submitted, very few actually become law. But at the same time, it's also that you comment on things, you join the conversation, you stand up for issues, you make a point, you use your platform to tell everybody about Guam. And we see him do that every once in a while, but not enough, especially compared to his predecessors who didn't have the benefit of social media. Mm. So when you look at the documentary record in the archives for both Madeline and Underwood, their offices produced far more for the public to see what they're doing. And, so and he has to try to get input too from his constituency. And he, he's not very good at that. Mm. Um, I Pete, will Pete, say that Pete, in the Pete, very Pete, Pete, I was a very Pete, strong supporter. Sorry, Pete, let's uh, give, give uh, Beauty a, a chance and Joni. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead ladies. Go ahead, Ms. Joni. I, I'm, I'm honestly learning a lot and, you know, being able to absorb as much as I can um, to make a better educated decision, guys. Yeah. And, of course, like I said, I'm going to do my own research and, nice. and until it's time to vote. But, um, Ms. Joni, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, Are we comp commenting on the social media? Uh, just or? the media. Um, what could the delegates do to improve, or the candidates do to improve maybe their relationship with the media? Or, you know, what do you think the status of that relationship is? Well, I think that as much as possible, you want to be able to, you want to be visible. And so if, with COVID, it's not, um, you're really limited. And so the, the use of social media is, is really important. Um, but there's also written media, the PDN and so on. There are other people, the radio, there are other people here who are not on social media. My parents are not on social media. There's a there's a whole segment of the population that doesn't know what Facebook is, right? Mm. I mean, that don't have a, a, a phone. They don't, you know, they, they watch TV, they watch the news, they, wa they read the news, the PDN or the Post, um, and they listen to the radio. So if I think that it would behoove any of these, any of the candidates not to take advantage of as much interaction with the media, with the people, whether it be indirectly or directly. Um, I, I have to go, I have a 10 o'clock. However, I just wanted to leave again. Uh, advice to the three candidates is um, when, like you said, when we get serious about choosing, right now we're just being entertained, that's a lot of fun. Hmm. But we get to really just choosing. We wanna see a list of, of, of issues and each one of their positions. It's like when we're going to buy gasoline or we're deciding where we're going to buy, um, where, where they're going to shop at American Market or Payless. Uh, we're going to say, how much are their apples? What's the quality of their apples? What about this? What about that? And then we look at the overall score. And it'd be really helpful, and I think the media would be really helpful, um, if they would start listing and saying, okay, on this issue, this is what we think this candidate is about. This is what this one is and this one. This is why the negative campaigns are okay if they also tie it back, well, that's what he did, but this is how I would do it. To just simply say, that guy's bad, well, guess what? We're, we're all Christians, we're all sinners. There's a lot of bad things you can dig about everyone's past. Um, so it's not good enough to simply say, he bad man. It's, he's done this and I'm gonna do this. Um, and, and that's why I think the sex issue isn't as big an issue to me. I mean, it is important because mm. if he doesn't, is unfaithful to his wife, he's probably going to be unfaithful to us. Uh, so that is disturbing. But on the other hand, we're all sinners. Um, I'm more interested in what are their public positions on very critical issues. In this case, we have the military buildup issue. Right. We have our relationship with the United States. Um, we like one of the issues I'd like to know is, is he in favor of moving the postal uh, the customs 
uh, from Hawaii to Guam. Right now, we're considered international. Right. And that affects our ability to order things on Amazon and mm. those other things, which oh. are now becoming even more important. A lot of those places. The real issues. To Guam, those, all, all those other issues. So right. I, mean, I, I would really love if we could start asking three of them a list of questions of this issue, this issue, this issue, this issue, and cover the whole gamut of things. Right. And then like our shopping list, at the end of the day, we, we, um, we look at, and you know, not every candidate is going to be perfect on our list. But one the one that has the most amount that we feel comfortable that oh yes we agree with that and so my advice to any of the candidates is please contrast yourself to your opponent how are you different than him don't just simply say he's bad right also say but this is how I would have dressed it beauty is a person you much, thank you Mike I, thank sorry, you so much for joining us Mike beauty I'm gonna give you the last word just because I feel like you you keep saying you're not political you're not this but you know what you got the power this primary election. So we're going to give you the last word. Uh, what's your takeaway from our, our conversation? Thank you so much. I Like for me, and what I tell a lot of other young people as well is your vote definitely counts and you have to make an educated one. You can't just go in and just like tick off whoever's at the just to get out of there. You want to be able to go in and um, feel prepa- prepared and feel armored because that's the future of not just ourselves, but our children are it's at stake. We want to be able to um, also give that power as well as a community as a whole and know that we're making the best decisions that we possibly can. And if, man, if you don't agree with any of those names on that ballot, then you better be running yourself. Hmm. Thank you, Beauty. Thank you. Thank you, Pete, Jody, Mike. Guys, we're going to keep you on file uh, to bring you guys back on for another after party in the future. All right. Great panel. Really loved it. Um, (laughs) Sabrina, is there something going on? No, I'm just looking at a few things. Okay, because you're making me nervous. So I think. No, the, yeah. yeah, I'm looking at this. All right, good job today, Bree. Good, good job this week. Oh, good, good job this week. Good Everybody. job this week, man. You know, we wanted to do wanted to do this <clears throat> show, loving it. So happy every morning we got the opportunity to go on and to get some info out to you guys. Maybe mm-hmm. entertain you a little bit and. Yeah. Uh, Bring on people who got things that right. you guys need to and know. Just, and just real quickly, we tried to get on Raleigh uh, Zabala and uh, Bobby Zamora. There were right. some technical issues. I'm not sure what was going on. Um, so, uh, guys, apologize. Couldn't get you guys on. Maybe next time. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, yeah. And so, if if you uh, would like to be uh, on the after party panel, no. yeah, we're looking for uh, people. In fact, I like people who say that oh, I don't know anything about politics. I mean, some of you guys who are Captain Keyboard in here on the social mm-hmm. media. We want to get you on the yep. after party. So hit us up in our uh, DM. Hit us in the DM. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, we'd uh, love to hear from everybody and right. anybody, no matter who you support. Exactly. Please. please. So uh, 1005 uh, for Jason Salas, for Joe Sir, uh, Master Control, Ken Engineer, and of course our uh, KUAM uh, reporter family who give us everything to talk about every single morning here on the link. Thank you guys so much. Guam, remember, we've got a surge. Public Health is out there trying to investigate this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, they're not going to finish it today, so mm-hmm. I feel like we are all at risk. Right, and and right now community testing. We heard it from uh, Annette again that it's difficult to have community testing. They can't because um, they just don't have enough uh, nurses to do it because the the whole uh, GDOE situation with their nurses Crazy. augmenting public Crazy. health staff. They have to go back and and uh, prepare for the opening of schools and go back to their jobs. So community testing, as far as we know, is um, on hold. That's, I can't even, so. yeah, so just don't go anywhere. Stay home. I'm stay going safe. back to stay home. Practice social distancing. Wash your thumbs. Wash your hands. Wear your mask. Okay, Guam, we got this. We got the power. Have a safe weekend, everybody. All right, my name is Chris for Sabrina. Hasta adios. Bye. We're